concerns um, that that we have with respect to these children. Um, four of our witnesses were children at the time of the incident. Two of them still are minors, but those concerns are that those individuals, these are children who did not choose to be a part of this case. These are individuals who were going about their day and happened to see a man die before their eyes. And they didn't choose to be part of this process, and they're going to have to live with being a part of this process for the rest of their lives. So we want to make sure that we are adequately addressing their privacy concerns. Obviously, it's something that is pretty commonplace with respect to child victims and witnesses. Um, it's, it's pretty standard for you know, court documents to ref refer to minors by their initials or by some pseudonym. Um, if the court is inclined to maintain the audio coverage portion of these individuals' testimony, uh, we, would, we would at least ask that the court consider use of pseudonym with respect to you know, the individuals just using their first names who were minors at the time. I did speak with Mr. Nelson about this briefly this morning. I understand that the defense does not object to us using only first names with respect to any of these individuals who were minors at the time. Um, and obviously, the, the reason for that is we want to make sure that we are protecting the interests, the privacy concerns of these individuals, and, and honoring those wishes, Your Honor. All right. Uh, Ms. Walker, did you wish to respond on behalf of the Media Coalition? And you can remove your mask if you'd like. Thank you, Your Honor, and thank you for making time for the Media Coalition to be heard this morning. Um, if the court wants to instruct the trial participants to refer to these, um, frankly, to, to any witness by their initials or by their first name, um, the Media Coalition has no objection to that. We want to write to um, live stream what happens in court and, and whatever they're called when they're on the stand is what will be live streamed. Um, I understand the court may be contemplating allowing at least two witnesses who remain minors to uh, identify themselves with the audio turned off um, and then turn the audio on for their actual testimony. And Your Honor, the coalition has no objection to allowing the two uh, witnesses who remain minors um, to do that. You know, as a practical matter, I think it's easy to figure out who they are by their initials. Their names appear on the witness list. And there should not be a prohibition on reporting anything that's already public. But if it gives these minors some comfort to not have to say their name with the audio on, that's fine with the media coalition. Um, let me talk just a minute, though, about the, the notion of turning the audio off and also turning the video off for the two witnesses who may have been minors at the time of the events in question but are now adults. And we really view this, Your Honor, as a second motion by the state for reconsideration of your November 4th order. Um, your order was very clear. You stuck by that order on their first motion to reconsider. And we really don't think you ought to entertain a, a second motion to reconsider. Um, one witness in particular, Your Honor, is particularly important to this case. Her initials are DF. Um, you know, the Media Coalition is, is sympathetic to the personal cost she bears in coming to testify, but she's an adult now. Um, her testimony will be key. My understanding is that she is the bystander who filmed the viral cell phone video that is at the center of this case. Um, and, and while what she saw may have been traumatic, uh, she's an adult. And, and I think it's important to remember that two things. One, I wanted to say that the state just said that many of the witnesses have expressed discomfort with audio, video. I don't know if that was an intentional hedge, Your Honor, but if, if DF has not expressed discomfort, then we don't really even need to be talking about it. And I question whether she has, because she has, in fact, been quite public. And just to give you a sense, she was interviewed by the Star Tribune uh, shortly after George Floyd died. She's authorized her attorney to speak to the press, including after she was publicly commended by the chief of police. She's furnished photographs of herself to the Star Tribune and other media. 
She publicly received in a virtual gala an award from Spike Lee. That video remains online, including on the Star Tribune's website. And as you all probably know, just a couple of weeks ago, she posted about jury selection uh, to her public Facebook page. So for all of these reasons, and that was covered by the Star Tribune as well, I have a link if, if you're interested. Um, it, it's a little bit farcical to suggest that no one knows who she is. Um, she is an adult, and we believe she should testify publicly both on audio and video, consistent with your November 4th order. Um, that's true for the other adult witness who may have been a minor at the time, um, although again, um, I don't believe that person has been uh, quite so public with um, her involvement in this case. Um, but we believe you should stick by your November 4th order. I'm happy to answer any questions on that. Well, first of all, any broadcast is an expansion of the rules. So you would agree with that. The fact that I am ex oh, broadcasting yes, anything is... Yes, but I believe you are correct that the f rules must bow to the First Amendment in this case. All right. Thank you. Right. As to the state's motion to restrict the audio feed of the four witnesses, all of whom were minors at the time, two have since turned 18 years of age, I'm going to deny that motion uh, with one exception. So essentially, their testimony will be allowed by audio. As to all four, I'm going to allow them to, when they, after they receive the oath, to state and spell their names, but off of the audio feed. So that will not go beyond this courtroom. Much as we dealt with jurors who were discussing private matters during jury selection. Uh, they may be referred to by first names by other witnesses. That's fine. Uh, so essentially, my order as far as audio is the same as previously ordered with one exception, that being their names will be given and spelled in the courtroom, publicly, on the record, but without the audio feed going out. As to video, I am going to, uh, even though two are technically 18, given their young age, I am going to continue to suppress the video for those minors as well, all of whom object. At least that's my understanding, is that correct? That's correct, All, all right, all four of those witnesses do object to video, and thus uh, I know technically that two are now adults, and it's pro and the and uh, Ms. Walker is, I'm sure, very correct that people will be able to figure out who these people are. But in order to give them, this is more to give them comfort, at testifying as witnesses in what is a very high-profile trial. Uh, and given their young age, I am going to grant it as far as these four witnesses, but no others. So no video at all. Audio as previously ordered with the one modification that their names will be not given out over the audio feed. Now, having said that, media is present. They can report out the full name. I cannot uh, uh, impose a prior restraint on that. Uh, and so it is going to be said in a public courtroom. I would note that uh, allowing the audio stream, uh, despite their discomfort, when we compare to what we put, for example, a young criminal sexual conduct victim who has to testify about deeply traumatic and terrifying uh, sexual abuse sitting in front of their abuser, with the public present in a larger courtroom. I think we, we do, unfortunately, have to ask a lot of our witnesses, especially ones who are minors, who are victims, and who are victims of terrible trauma. These, on the other hand, are witnesses. They are not victims, per se. Uh, I'm sure it had an effect on them, but they are not victims, per se. They are bystanders uh, testifying about to what they saw happening to Mr. Floyd. So with that, uh, any questions about the court's restrictions? All right, and we are going to have all four of them come one after the other. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right, and for those four, one requires a support person. Is that correct? That's correct. 
We have a second chair set up right next to the witness stand. And the, uh, the TV feed will not include that support person. At most an elbow, but even then we're gonna try and keep the camera uh, shot very tight just on the witness. And for the minors, it's not gonna be on at all. So it's not gonna be a problem. Very good. The camera will be on the seal. Okay, I think, uh, is there anything else? Uh, the jurors are starting to arrive, but I don't think we have a full compliment yet. Anything else for the record? Nothing from the state, John. All right. All right. Uh, the earliest we're going to be able to start is 9.15 if we have everybody, but let's 9.15 at the very earliest, probably 9.30. Thanks.
let's go. Test one two. Hi. Test one two. Check. You good? I ate a little breakfast. Thank you. So I feel good about that. Okay. Good. I didn't want to be hungry in here. Yeah. And Make sure your phone's on silent. Yes. Because it also vibrates. So who's the other reporter? Do you know? Um, he's like an independent reporter. Oh, okay. I think that's the trip required. Okay. Uh,
Good morning, members of the jury. I'm able to start a little early, so that's probably good. Good morning, Mr. Williams. Uh, just a reminder that you are still under oath. And Mr. Frank. Good morning again, Mr. Williams. Good morning, Mayor. And um, yesterday when we finished, um, we had a little abrupt end because of a question about the feed and that's been worked out. Um, so just to sort of revisit with you where we were when we left off yesterday, we had been going through that piece of video. You identified for the jurors things that you saw, particularly the shimmy moves that you saw. And so, um, so I want to move on then from that point and continue on with uh, our questioning this morning, okay? Correct. All right. Now, while you were standing there uh, watching this incident from the curb, were there things that you saw on Mr. Floyd's face that were significant to you? Correct. Uh, like I said before, uh, you could see that he was going through um, tremendous pain and you can see it in his face from the grunting. Uh, you can see his eyes slowly, you know, rolling back um, in his, his head and him having his mouth open, um, wide open slowly with drool and slob and dryness on his mouth. Um, and uh, you can see that he's trying to, you know, gasp for air, you know, and trying to um, be able to breathe. Uh, as he's down there and trying to move his face, you know, side to side so he can, you know, I'm, I'm believing, okay. I'm assuming gas for more air there. Uh, and, I'm not. Okay, and as you were standing there seeing all this, how were you feeling? Uh, as I was sitting there, I just was really trying to keep my professionalism this and make sure that I speak out for Floyd's um, life because I felt like he was in very much danger. And I seen another man like me, you know, being controlled in a way where- Yeah, let me, let me just- This is- yeah. We can stop. That answers the question. We'll Correct. ask another question. And um, were you scared for yourself? Uh, yes, I was totally scared for my safety and uh, people around me, you know, okay. and that's... And so, um, did you feel like you could intervene in the situation more than verbally, more than speaking? Not as much, no. I, I, as much as I wanted to, my energy didn't let me, and, and I was controlled on the curb, so I did as much as I can. Now, you... Um, at some point learned the name of the officer Tao who was standing there, correct? Correct. So you know when I ask about that, you know who's, who I am referring to? Correct. And um, at, at some point did you step off the curb and have an interaction with Officer Tao? Yes, uh, I did step off the curb uh, and had an interaction with Officer Tao. And what did Officer Tao do? Uh, he proceeded to push his hand in my chest uh, swipe down, put my hands up, and I stepped back, put back on the curb. And did you make any further moves towards Officer Tao? No further moves. Okay. At some point, did a uh, person come up and identify herself as a Minneapolis firefighter? That is correct. Did you know her before that day? No, I did not know her. And uh, I think you said earlier she asked that they check his pulse? That is correct. Okay. And were there other than uh, other than you and her other bystanders on the sidewalk there? Yes, there were other bystanders on the sidewalk. Did you hear any of them threatening the safety of the police officers? No, I did not. And um, at some point, did you help, in fact, restrain some of those individuals? Correct. Once the situation got a little intense with someone who was going up behind me. I uh, spoke to one of the gentlemen and told him that this is not the time or place for this right now. And then he proceeded to go back into the building. 
So did you know that individual? Uh, no, I did not know the individual at all. Did you, you know, recognize him or know where he was from? No, I did not. Okay. At some point, did you ask him to go back in the store? That is correct. So you thought he had come from the store? That is correct. Right. And after you told him to do that, what did he do? Uh, he proceeded to uh, go back in the store, and uh, I believe he might have been escorted as he was crying back to the store. So he never made another move towards the police officers? That is correct. Mr. Williams, um, the jury has heard some audio and video of this incident already when you were there, and you were using some pretty strong language. That is correct. Um, you were raising your voice. That is correct. Why? Why for those, both of those? Uh, for, fear, for the fear of myself and fear of the people around me and trying to just be able to talk to the officer um, and let him know that you know this should not happen you know uh, just from being around different officers and working in that industry I, I just never seen that and I felt like I should speak on it and I vocalized it what were the kind of emotions that were causing you to speak like that um, no feeling or no remorse or no no response uh, from 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 the officer. Objection is non-responsive. Non-responsive is uh, sustained. Jerry will disregard the answer from the last question. If you could be a little more precise in framing your question, Mr. Frank, I think that would help. I certainly could, Your Honor. Okay. The emotions that you were feeling that caused you to use this kind of language and that tone of voice. Yeah, the emotion that caused me to use this language in this voice was non-responsive from the officer. Sustained. Disregard the answer. So let me, I guess, let me ask you this way. Were there things that you were seeing about the officers that also caused you concern? Correct. The, and what was that? The non-response from an officer. Okay. So that was something that was also affecting how you were feeling about the incident. That is correct. And so then, um, that led into part of why you were raising your voice and, and using the terms used. That is correct. When the, uh, were you present when the ambulance arrived? That is correct. Now at any time during this interaction, did you see Officer Chauvin take his knee um, off of Mr. Floyd's neck? No. Okay. At, when the ambulance arrived, did he do that? No. And um, and uh, did you see uh, a paramedic, you know, an ambulance personnel check for Mr. Floyd's pulse? Rephrase the question. Repeat yeah. the question. Yep. When the paramedics arrived, did you continue to watch when the paramedics got out of the ambulance and, and checked on Mr. Floyd? Yes, I did okay. watch. Did you see if they checked for Mr. Floyd's pulse? Um, I believe that they were attempting to go check for the pulse, and the knee was still, he was still on top of him. Did he check the pulse? I, I cannot recollect. Like, I don't remember if he was able to even check his pulse, but I remember that. How did you answer there? It was responsive to that point. I think you've Next answered question. the question. Thank cool. you. Now, when um, the paramedics loaded Mr. Floyd into the ambulance, were you still there at the scene? That is correct. All right. And after that happened, um, did you see what the officers did? Well, let me back you up a little bit. At some point, did you learn that there were more than um, those two officers at the scene? That is correct. When did you learn that? Uh, once the ambulance have arrived, uh, I did uh, notice that there was more than uh, one officer, uh, more than two officers on the scene. And so where did you see, or how did you see these other officers? Uh, once they started to load Mr. Floyd onto the straddle, to, uh, not the no technical name of it, but they put him onto the little bed thing. To the gurney or the stretcher? The gurney, correct, yes, you are. 
And um, and then when they did that, you saw these other officers? Correct. Where, right. where had they been or where did they come from? Uh, they were on the bottom side of Floyd or uh, trying to get his feet on uh, to the uh, recurring and yeah. Then you, were, then you were able to see them? Correct. All right. And after Mr. Floyd was put into the ambulance and the ambulance left, um, did you stay at the scene for a little while? That is correct. Okay, so right after the ambulance left, did you see what, where the officers went? That is correct. Where did they go? Uh, they proceeded to cut to the other side, uh, front of the store, which is uh, 38th, Chicago this way. So they proceeded to go towards 38th um, and proceed to go away from this, the scene. And, and were you still in that same emotional mindset? Well, <laughs> yes, I was uh, very lost at the moment and I was very nervous and not knowing what to do. And yes. And um, did you, in fact, um, stay around at the scene for a little while? Yes, I did. At some point, um, did you make a 911 call? That is correct. Uh, I did call the police on the police. Right. And why did you do that? Because uh, I believe I witnessed a murder. And so you felt a need to call the police? Yeah, I felt the need to call the police on the police. Now, there were police there, right? There were, po there were police there. Okay. Why didn't you just talk to them about it? I believe that they didn't. I just, we just didn't have no connection. You know, I spoke to them, but not on a connection of or a human being relationship. Um, did you, well, believe that they were involved? Yes, totally. Um, and so when you made that 911 call, about how long after the ambulance left was that? Time recollection, I don't know. Matter of minutes, M minutes, seconds, not too, not too long after they retreated to the other side of the street, I proceeded to call the police. And uh, prior to today, have you had an opportunity to listen to a recording of that nine one one call? Can you please repeat that question? Prior to coming to court today, did we play for you a copy of that nine one one call, a recording of it? I would not say yes or no. I cannot remember at this moment. Okay. If you heard that today, would you be able to recognize it as the 911 call that you made? That is correct. All right. We have now marked that um, as Exhibit 20. And, um, Your Honor, we would ask that it be, well, we are offering it now as Exhibit 20. And 20 is received. All right. So um, if we can at this point, then play Exhibit 20. Exhibit 307, May 25, 2020. 911, what's the address of the emergency? Officer 987 killed a uh, citizen in front of a Chicago uh, store. He just pretty much just killed this guy that wasn't resisting arrest. He had his knee on the dude's neck the whole time, Officer 987. The man went, uh, went stopped breathing. He wasn't resisting arrest or nothing. He was already in handcuffs. They pretty much just killed that dude. I don't even know if he did for sure, but he just was not responsible when the ambulance just came and got him. And the officer that was just out here left, the one that actually just murdered the kid in front of everybody on 36, 38th in uh, Chicago. Okay. Would you like to speak with the, the sergeant? Yeah, like that was bogus yes. what they just did to this man. He was one unresponsive. Second. He wasn't resisting arrest or any of it. Okay, let me get you over to the desk so you can request to speak with the sergeant, okay? Yeah, and I'm sitting here talking to, uh, with another off-duty uh, firefighter that just stayed here watching in front of us as well. Okay. And she told him to check the, the main pulse, but they wouldn't even check the, uh, the pulse. Okay, one second. Okay, one second. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. I've reached the city of Minneapolis to reach someone in our property crimes division. Y'all murderers, bro. Y'all murderers, pal. You, you gonna kill yourself. I already know it. Two more years, you gonna shoot yourself. Murderers, bro. Y'all niggas is murderers, bro. Minneapolis, sir, first thing. 
his perception. Yeah, no, man, so on. I want to speak There's to the supervisor. No. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, he wants to speak with the supervisor relating to 320's cause. Cup food. Okay. Okay. May Is that then an accurate recording of the call you made? That is correct. That and so. at the beginning, you referred to Officer 987. Where did you get that number from? Honestly, it was just visually popped in my head. Okay. Like, I, I looked at his badge, and that's what I read on his badge. And so whose badge, which officer were you referring to? The officer sitting over there. Okay. And, and was that also the officer that had his knee on George Floyd's neck? That is correct. And for the record, when your previous answer, you were pointing to the defendant, Mr. Chauvin? That's correct. Okay. And, um, and so the, the purpose in making, what was the purpose in making that 911 call at that time? I just felt like that was the right thing to do. I didn't know what else to do. I didn't, I didn't know what to do. But and, call. I'm sorry, I cut you off. But call. And the response then was to transfer you to a sergeant, correct? That is correct. And then at some point the call, it sounds like you're talking to Officer Tao. Do you recall if you were actually talking to Officer Tao at that point? That is correct. Right. I, I was because I think at the moment, or I don't think at the moment that I was making the call, he proceeded to like intimidate me and stick his camera in my face, his body cam, and. Okay, and the call sort of ends abruptly. Did you hang up and terminate the call? I'm not 100% sure, but I may have, because I felt threatened once our interaction happened in front of the store with me and Tyler. And then from there, after hanging up, um, did you stick around for a while and talk to some other people there? Yeah, I went to do my own investigation. Your Honor, I have no further questions. Mr. Nelson. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, can I ask what you're looking at? Uh, just notes, that's all. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to ask that you put those to the side, okay? Cool, thanks. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your patience yesterday. Thank you for being here this morning. I just have some follow-up questions for you, all right? Yep. Um, you testified yesterday that you started wrestling in the seventh grade, is that correct? That is correct. And over time, you were talking about how you learn how to control your body weight, right? That is correct. And one of the things that you kind of uh, talked about was when early in your instruction in wrestling, um, you call it, I think, flow wrestling. That's correct. And as I understand that, and correct me if I'm wrong, flow wrestling is kind of learning, learning how to kind of keep your center of balance, learning how to, sometimes it may feel you should use your arm when you should really use your leg. Kind of just learning how your body works, right? Yeah, correct, less resistance less resistance. So sometimes less resistance is actually better in certain circumstances. Repeat that. Sure. I mean, if you're on the mat, right, and your instinct is to push your arm out to the side to try to use your body weight to roll, you may want to actually use your leg to roll the other way, right? Kind of like flow. Mm. Kind of, but not really. Okay, how would you describe just the flow of wrestling? Flow is less, uh, flow is more, I'm flowing with you without using my strength. I'm flowing with you going 50, 60% of it. I'm flowing with you, letting you get into a half Nelson and 
you feel the half notes and you're in it and then now you're flowing your partner's letting you flow off your back and get into a position where you get into a stand up into escape uh flow is where i uh, my partner's letting me get in on a double and i'm flo- letting him finish the, the double and now i'm flowing into my offensive or my defensive position of getting away so right. different position right so you're learning how to use your body weight against the weight of the other person you're wor- learning how to just get in and out of moves, right? Flowing. Flowing, right. And that's something that you learned, you know, at a young age in the sport of wrestling. Correct. And as you continued your wrestling career, you testified that you wrestled all the way through high school and then into college for a couple of years as well. That's right? correct. And you would agree that wrestling is a sport. Wrestling is a lifestyle. Okay. I mean, there are rules, there are points, there are referees, so there are. There's a sport to wrestling, right? Correct. And I understand as a wrestler, it's a lifestyle, right? <laughs> yeah. But to the kind of the casual observer, maybe it's just a sport, right? Correct. All right. Um, but you're, you know, you're learning how to keep your center of gravity lower, and and grapple with people. Correct. Right. And then you testified that. Um, after you kind of got out of college or finished your career in college, that you, you started moving more towards uh, the mixed martial arts, right? Correct. And so you were training in jiu-jitsu, I believe you said? That is correct. All right. And again, jiu-jitsu is a form of martial arts, right? Correct. Lots of forms of martial arts, right? Correct. Judo, karate, Krav Maga, these are all various forms of martial arts that you have some general familiarity with, right? Correct. But your training is specifically in Jiu-Jitsu, correct? No, I'm a martial artist. I train Jiu-Jitsu, Muay Thai, uh, stick fighting, like I'm a martial artist. I don't just train Jiu-Jitsu. Okay. I stay in boxing, you know, wrestling all is put into one. So as a fighter, you're not just working on a ground game. You're working on your stand-up. You're working, you know, your, your Muay Thai, uh, your kickboxing, things like that. That's what a martial artist is. Okay. So you incorporate several forms of martial arts into you, what you study. That is correct. All right. And again, um, the, the notion of a chokehold is very common within the martial arts community, right? That is correct. Submissions. Submissions. Um, and there are many forms, right? Correct like the triangle or the rear naked chokehold, all sorts of different types of chokeholds or submission holds that uh, apply. That is correct. All right. And again, I understand that martial arts is a lifestyle, but there is a sport to it as well, right? That, uh, uh, yeah, competitive side, so yeah, sports. Right. Correct. And I'm just talking generally, I'm not talking about the MMA fighting yet, but just even as a... As a martial artist, there are competitions with rules and referees and things of that nature. That right? is correct. All right. And uh, when you, whether you wrestle or you compete in the mixed mar- or in the martial arts, there are weight classes, right? That, that is correct. Well, yeah, that's correct. Uh, MMA has weight classes. Jiu-Jitsu tournaments, uh, there's open weights. So if I, you, know, you win your weight division, you have a chance to wrestle in open division, which usually time if I'm competing in just a tournament, I'll do an open division, which is open weight. All right. So again, generally, like looking at your career as a wrestler, you what weight did you wrestle at? Uh, I wrestled anywhere from 106 to 141 in college. Okay. And when you would competitively wrestle, you would wrestle with other people who were in that same weight class, right? Correct. And then in the martial arts, in the competitions for the martial arts, there are weight classes, but there's also this open weight class, right? That's correct, for jiu-jitsu. In jiu-jitsu, and so you, as a 141-pound guy, may wrestle or may uh, grapple with someone who's 180 pounds. Or 220, 210. Right, or 100. Yeah. Right? I mean... Okay, um, but then about 10 years ago, you testified that you started uh, with mixed martial arts. Let's repeat that, please. I believe that you testified yesterday that about 10 years ago, you began training in mixed martial arts. Correct, martial arts. Yep. Yeah, like tennis. MMA. Yeah, MMA, mixed martial arts. Yeah. All right, 
and maybe I'm confused, like, did you, of your progression? So you go from wrestling to boxing to mixed martial arts? So I went from wrestling in college to training in a martial arts school, okay. which covers martial arts. Okay. Muay Thai, Jiu Jitsu, boxing, mixed martial arts, okay. wrestling. And that's I mean, because there are some, I mean, again, there are some um, uh, businesses or gyms that will train in a specific form of a martial art, right? Correct. You have some that just do box. You have boxing gyms. You have jiu-jitsu gyms. You have Muay Thai gyms. Or Krav Maga or, Krav, or whatever. Yeah, whatever, anything, right. stuff like that. You know, you have different specialty of martial arts for different schools. But some schools, which I, one of the schools I was at, the Academy under Greg Nelson, he taught a variety of martial arts. It was a martial arts school. Okay. I'm understanding now that you went from the wrestling to the mixed martial arts. Right. And about 10 years ago, was it that you started competing in a mixed martial arts? I started competing right away. I went from wrestling in college to being one of the top amateur fighter, fighters in the Midwest to finish, you know, just growing as a martial artist. So I started, you know, at a different gym before I got to the academy. Um, learned to, I was a wrestler. I didn't know anything but wrestling, you know, at the time. So I'd take people down and ground and pound. And then I switched to gyms and went under Greg and I learned more jiu-jitsu. I learned more kicking. I learned different elbows. I learned, you know, different martial arts techniques, chokes, submissions, arm bars, things like that, spinning back fences, flying knees. I learned that. Right, okay. Right. When we talk about an MMA fight, Correct. right, um, all of those various methods of fighting are employed in those fights, right? Correct. So if I am a boxer and I start, I'm in a boxing match, right, yeah. um, I can't kick you, for example. No. But if I'm in an MMA fight, I may punch you, I might kick you, I might choke you, I, short of biting, right? Correct. Um, and the point of a mixed martial arts fight is to actually knock the person out, render him unconscious, right? That is correct. Control the cage. Right. Like that. We, you, you referenced the cage match, right? Yeah. I and mean, that's what we kind of think about when we think about mixed martial arts fights. Yeah. Is, you got cage fighting, which you see UFC, Bellator, LFA, all things like that. And then you have martial art tournaments where it just strictly jiu-jitsu, your, your gi, you have blue belts, black belts, white belts, purple belts, they all compete at a level. No striking, just just all grappling. Then you have like the ones that are us in the cage, we do everything, punch, kick, you know, all that stuff. Right. Yeah. And um, I believe according to your your professional record, because you, you had an amateur career, and then you had a professional career, right? Correct. And you had 11 professional fights? Possibly, I don't even know how many fights I technically had. So, <laughs> well, you know the internet exists, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know your statistics are saved. Yeah. All right. And so, if I say that your professional record uh, was five wins, six losses in eleven fights, would you disagree with that? But I think about, I think I might be sixty-six. I okay. Just my, yeah, yeah. I think I'm actually sixty-six. Okay. Yeah. And. Um, when you fight in an MMA fight, in these kind of open freestyle fights, uh, you fight in a weight class, right? Correct. All right. Uh, people who are similar in terms of their weight, they may be taller, they may be shorter, but they're in the same weight class. Correct. All right. Okay. Um, and again, I mean, there's a referee, right? Correct. And certain fights, when you get someone into a submission hold, the referee may come and lift up the person's arm to see if they're conscious or unconscious, right? That's correct. That's a way of determining whether or not That's the if they're not moving. I mean, if they're not, that's if they're not moving, if they're not fighting and stuff like that. Yeah, the referee has to, he has to make sure that the person is conscious. So he, he might say, keep moving. If they're not moving, he might check, you know, and sometimes the opponent will know that that person's out. So the opponent, if you look at the ref, like, look, he's out, like he's out, he's out, you know, right. things like that. And sometimes you don't know that they're out, and the, that's why the ref comes and picks up the arm, right? Most opponents know when they put their person out. But it's possible, right? It's a yes or no question. It's, it's possible. All right. How about that? Um, 
as a part of your training in the mixed martial arts, you um, voluntarily submitted to being put into chokeholds, correct? At practice. At practice, right. And you also practiced these moves, right? That's correct. Putting, rendering other people in practice unconscious. That's right? correct. And in your professional career, uh, you were also uh, at times have rendered people unconscious and been rendered unconscious yourself. Correct. Um, through one of these chokeholds. Correct. All right. Now you described um, these chokeholds generally yesterday. Um, these chokeholds, like you described an air choke and a blood choke. Correct. You, you remember your conversation about that yesterday? Yes, correct. All right. So when you, um, when you use these forms of chokeholds, whether it's an air choke or a blood choke, they use those in various forms of martial arts, right? Like judo, krav maga. A chokehold is sort of across the board in terms of martial arts. Correct. With the exception of maybe the stick fighting, right? Correct. All right. Um, and you testified that you, at your academy, you train with a lot of law enforcement officers, military people, um, and law enforcement from both state and federal levels, right? That is correct. And you said you didn't, sometimes you don't even know that that's what they do, right? That is correct, depending on what level. And sometimes you get to know these guys because you're fighting with them, right? Yeah. You're training with them and they tell you a little bit about their lives, right? Sometimes, I mean, we, we just build a brotherhood of the gym. You know, some people interact outside with personal life. Some people just interact in the gyms, you know, and build a relationship. So I see you on an everyday basis. Like at work, I go in, I see you every day. I interact with you there. Then I'm gonna interact with you outside of work, you know? Right. And then okay. there's some that I interact with outside of okay. the gym. Um, but I just wanna make sure you've never officially been invited to go to like the Minneapolis Police Academy to train law enforcement in the use of the force no I or the know. use of these chokeholds no. and you, or any other police academy for that reason. no I witnessed my sensei Greg Nelson I'm asking training. about you sir have you ever officially been asked to train police officers specifically in the use of chokeholds no just witnessed it okay now Air chokes. You described air chokes yesterday. Air chokes are from the front, correct? Correct. And that's because what you're doing is you're actually cutting off the air correct. to the correct. trachea. Correct. Right? So you can render someone unconscious by coming from the front of the neck and uh, cutting off their airway, which renders them unconscious. Repeat that. Sure. An air choke is a front choke, agreed? Yeah. And what you're doing in an air choke is you're cutting off the air supply or the oxygen supply from the front of the neck, correct? Correct. And in doing so, you can render a person unconscious, correct? On an air choke? I'm not a medical person, so I won't answer that. Okay. Um, on a blood choke, right, what you're doing is you're cutting off, and you described yesterday, the blood supply to the brain, right? Okay, side choke, correct. A, a side choke. And you described several different types of chokeholds, like the revert or the re rear naked chokehold, I think it's called, or the triangle. What you're doing is you're actually cutting off the blood supply to both sides of the neck in those. Repeat that. When you do a blood choke, what you're trained on generally is to limit the blood supply to both sides of the neck. No, a blood choke is attack one side of the neck. It's just one side of the neck. Okay. The blood choke is attack the side of the side of the neck. So my choke's from here, side of the neck. Right, but you're but you're using your weight and you're actually cutting off both sides. You're using your body and your arm. Right? And you're actually protecting the trachea or the airway in the crux of your... You're mixing chokes. So you're mixing your air chokes and your blood chokes together. Air choke is to attack the trachea. A side, ch uh, a side choke is to attack the side of the neck. So if, if I have someone in a chokehold, right? 
and a blood chokehold from the with my using my arm I may have my hand behind that person right no. no, it's not. I'm attacking the side of the neck, not the trachea. You're attacking the trachea. I'm sorry, I'm the side I'm, choke. I'm saying that the trachea is protected by the the crux of the elbow, and so you're using the forearm and the bicep to cut off both sides of the of the blood. Correct. From here to here, from here to here, right. You're cutting That's off it. one side of the, uh, of the neck on a choke. Okay. How long does that usually take in your experience? To render someone unconscious. You go unconscious on the side on a blood choke within seconds. Some people don't even know that they're about to go un unconscious. Right. You were interviewed by the FBI, right? That is correct. Right. It was I believe it was Agent Garvey of the FBI, right? Are you does it, are you looking at some notes to refresh your recollection? No, I, just, I have it in front of me. That's okay. correct. Would that help? I, I, would that help you refresh your recollection? I mean, yeah. That's why I just opened it. Up. Yeah. That's correct. It's kind of weird. We have rules in court. You have to testify from your memory, not your notes. But if it's you need not to notes, I'm okay. just look. The name is on the front of the page. What I'm saying is, if you need to refer to your whatever it is you have in front of you to help you refresh your recollection, we need to get permission from the court to do that. So it's a weird procedure that we. I have don't know to do. his name, so I look to see what his name was. Okay. Correct. Would it help you remember his or her name if you looked at your paper in front of you? Uh, that's correct because it's in the paper. Okay. Same paper Your Honor, may he refer his notes? And it's going to refer to your notes silently. Correct. And once it's refreshed your memory, then close the notes back up and testify correct. from your memory. Yeah, definitely. Mr. Nelson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what was the name one more time, sir? I believe it was, there were two agents correct. there, right? One yeah. was from the BCA named Angela Garvey. That one's correct. And then uh, Eckert is the last name of the other? I believe that, yep, that is correct. Okay. And you were interviewed uh, by those agents on May the 29th of last year, correct? Correct, I believe so. Um, All right. You wouldn't, you, you know, we have a transcript of that statement yes. and the reports about it. Yes. Would you dispute me if I told you it was May 29th? I don't regularly the dates. Okay, fair enough. And do you recall them asking you about blood chokes and how long it takes to choke someone out? Correct. And you told them three to five seconds? Correct, just like I just told you within seconds. Right. And an MMA round is three minutes, right? No, that's for amateurs. MMA round uh, is five minute rounds. Five, okay. Three minutes for amateurs, five minutes for pros. All right. So three to five minutes are per round of an MMA fight. Oh, an MMA fight. Right. Okay. Have you ever, um, whether it be in your training, after you have rendered someone unconscious, where they come back to and they start fighting again? Inside of a fight? Mm -hmm. Have I choked someone out and they came back to? No. Like, it's to finish fighting the referee. Will Have you stuff. seen that happen in practice? Restate, re rephrase it, or so please some, repeat so the question. I will do so. Well, someone, you rendered someone unconscious, right? You're, you're fighting with them. They've gone unconscious. You've released your chokehold from them. Have you ever experienced someone coming back and starting to fight you again right away? Yes, you, and, and uh, personally, no. Have I seen it? Yes. Okay, fair enough. So you've seen after someone is unconscious, they come back to consciousness and they start fighting right away again. You've yeah. seen that happen. I've seen it on the UFC multiple times where when someone gets choked out, they come back to and they continue to try to fight and the referee has to explain to them that they've been unconscious. I've been knocked out and I had to come back conscious and the first thing I wanted to do was continue to fight. And then when I was in the locker room and they told me that the fight was already over. So I have no recollections of what happened in that moment. Okay, great. Now you testified that um, one of the things that you do and have done in your career is to work as a security guard, right? That is correct. And you've worked as a security guard in a variety of contexts, right? That's correct. So you've done some personal security for people? Correct. And you've done some like kind of doorman stuff, right? 
That's correct. Bouncing, I guess, is correct. what you would call it. And you said that you have worked alongside the Minneapolis Police Department in those club type situations with off duty officers and on duty officers. That is correct. Okay. The um, in that capacity, have you ever had to deal with a crowd of people? That is correct. Have you ever had to deal with a crowd of people that was upset? Definitely. Is it easier or harder to deal with a crowd that is upset? Each person is different. Me, I'm able to deal with the high capacity of uh, distractions, uh, different things going on, and still be able to be professional and focus on what is going on in front of me. And um, have you ever uh, been involved in a situation where there's a crowd that's upset and you were um, afraid of them? Correct. I'd like to direct your attention to the incident uh, on May 25th of 2020 that you've testified about. You were shown an exhibit uh, yesterday that shows that you were you arrived at the Cup Foods on the 38th Street side of Cup Foods at 8.23 and 12 seconds. Do you re Don't do recollect the time, sir. Okay. Um, would you like me to show you that exhibit or would you agree that uh, that's probably correct? I can show you the yeah, exhibit. Show me the exhibit. showing you exhibit 18. Yeah, you can see that? Yeah, correct. Um, this was already admitted into evidence yesterday. You would agree that exhibit 18 shows you walking along 38th Street on May 25th, 2020 at 8.23 and 12 seconds. Correct. Okay. So, I'm not trying to trick you. All right. That's yeah, fine. All right. And it's fair to say that prior to your arrival there, you had no idea what had been going on in the area. No, not at all. Like I said, I just seen squad cars and didn't know what was going on. Right. And you testified that as you kind of came around the corner, your energy sort of pulled you towards that incident, right? Yeah, that's totally correct. So you would have absolutely no idea that an ambulance was called three minutes before you arrived. Don't know anything about that. You would be would have had no idea that an ambulance was stepped up to code three, which means get here quick, two minutes before you arrived. No regulation to have any of that. You weren't there, you wouldn't possibly know. Right? Wouldn't know at all. You testified that Kind of based on your experience as a, as a security guard, your first inclination is to just sort of observe everything that's going on, right? Totally correct. And that's what you did? That's why I felt like I did, correct. Okay. So it's fair to say that you had not observed any prior contact between the Minneapolis Police Department and Mr. Floyd? Only what I've seen. You would have no idea that they had been dealing with him for 15 minutes prior to your arrival. Objection, Your Honor. No, I'm all right. No, right? He can still answer that question? He can still answer that question. Oh. If you'd like to say Repeat that for sure. You were not aware that the police had been dealing with Mr. Floyd for 15 minutes prior to your arrival? Not at all. Now, you testified that as you were observing Mr. Floyd on the ground, 
you observe blood coming from his no nose or mouth area, right? Correct, and someone actually stated that if you watch the video. Right, I've, I've watched the video. Um, but you would not have been aware that three minutes prior to your arrival, an ambulance was called specifically because he was bleeding from the mouth. That had nothing to do with me, sir. But you made certain assumptions. What was your answer again? That it had nothing, recollection of that, nothing to do with me. Sometimes uh, the court reporter can't hear, so. That's the only reason for this. No, Your Honor, appreciate you, man. Okay. Mr. Nelson. Thank you. But you yesterday testified that you assumed that the blood coming from Mr. Floyd's nose and mouth area was from his face being pushed into the cement. Uh, I didn't say that. Okay. I don't. Uh, can you hear? There is no question. Yeah. You answered my question. Right. His blood coming through his nose. I said blood's coming through his nose. I didn't say how I got there or where. I'm going to ask him. That's non responsive objection. Yeah. You've answered my question, sir. All right. Stop. Objection is sustained. Jury disregarded the last remark that was not in response to a question. Mr. Nelson. Thank you. You testified that after the ambulance came, you saw two additional officers, right? Correct. And you, prior to that happening, had no idea that those two officers were back there, right? Correct. So it's fair to assume that you did not hear any of the conversations between the officers, correct? Tell didn't let me get close enough, correct. correct. The question is, did you hear any of the conversations between the officers, yes or no? Re please repeat that because you said it different the first time. Sure. Did you hear any of the conversation occurring between the three officers with Mr. Floyd Yes or no? No. It's fair to say that as you were uh, there, you grew angrier. Correct. Right. That's yes. what you perceive. Pardon? Is that, is that is that what you took from the video, correct? Right. As you were there and interacting with Officer Tao and Officer Chauvin, you grew more and more upset. Would you agree with that? Correct. You grew angry, right? Um, I grew control and professionalism. Okay. Again, you made a statement to Agents Garvey and Eckert And in that statement, you said... Your Honor, I'm going to object to this form of cross-examination. Overruled. Overruled. Proceed. Proceed. In that statement, you said, like, I really wanted to beat the shit out of the police officers. Mm -hmm. You said that. Yeah, I did. That's what I thought. You were angry. No, you can't pay, pay me. I was angry. I was, I was in a position where I had to be controlled, of control professionalism. I wasn't angry because I stayed on the curb. Object is non-responsive. Well, overruled, overruled. Stand. Next question. Thank you. You started calling them names. Yes? Yeah, you heard that, yeah, you heard right? the video. You called him a tough guy, right? You, you watched the video. You called him a real man, right? You watched the video. You do have to answer the question yes or no based on what he's asking. I'm going to ask you that again, so your answers should be yes or no, okay? Yes. You called him a tough guy. I did. You called him a real man. I did. You called him such a man. I did. You called him bogus. Hmm. I did. You called him a bum at least 13 times. That's what you counted in the video? That's what I counted. And that's what you got, 13. 
And that was early on, right? It, it, those terms grew more and more angry. Would you agree with that? They grew more and more pleading for life. All right. After you called him a bum 13 times, you called him a fucking bum. That's what you heard? Did you say that? Is that what you heard? I'm asking you, sir. I'm pretty did sure you I say did. that? You heard it. I'm pretty sure you did. You call him a fucking pussy ass bitch. If that's what you heard, I'm sure that's I'm what I'm asking did. you, did you say that? If that's what the video recalled, that's what I did. You called him a bitch. If that's the video you heard from the video, that's it's a what yes I did. or no, sir. If that's what was, what was heard in the video, yes, I did. And at one point, you said that Officer Tao pushed you. That's correct. I was just, he didn't. He put his hand in my chest. Is what I said. And you observed Officer Tao push someone else, right? Or feel like you he pushed someone else. I didn't let him touch anyone else. Do you recall saying, "I dare you to touch me like that"? I swear I'll slap the fucking the fuck out of both of you. Yeah, I did. I meant it. So again, sir, it's fair to say that you grew angrier and angrier. No, I grew professional and professional, and I stayed in my body. You can't pay me out to be angry. You were uh, not standing. You were walking around, right? Correct, patrol. And at times, you would go forward towards where Officer Chauvin was, right? Correct. And at times you'd walk to the side, correct? Well, I didn't really get too close to Officer Chauvin, actually. Uh, Tao did not allow me to get all close to Officer Chauvin. You so, attempted to walk closer? Uh, I stepped off the curb and I stepped back on the curb. Because Officer Tao didn't per permit you to go forward? He said step back on the curb. You were, your voice, right? You weren't just saying you're a bum. Would you agree with that? You said I wasn't just saying right. he was The a tone bum. of your voice. The tone of my voice was loud so people could hear me. And it grew louder and louder. So I could be heard. And after Mr. Floyd was taken by the ambulance, you continued to interact with Officer Tao, as well as uh, other people on the scene, correct? That's correct. After they retreated, I know that retreat, I said what I said. I know they can say more to me. And you continued to yell these types of things after Mr. Floyd was gone, right? Uh, me and Mr. Tao had words back and forth, correct. And I think you said something about um, hoping he would shoot himself. No, I didn't say I hope he's going to shoot himself. I said within the next two years, you will shoot yourself in your head for what you did. I didn't say hope. I don't hope death on anyone. The Bible doesn't allow that. So again, you continued to engage with these officers, right? Tao. And your voice was loud. Right? Yeah, he tried to intimidate me, so. The, the officers, most of the officers were on the other side of 38th Street. Me and Tao were standing in front of each other. At one point, Officer Tao goes across the street as well, right? They both had a retreat, correct. And you continued to yell these same types of things. Mm, probably, would. correct, yeah. Wasn't being heard. And it was over and over and over and over again, right? Because I wasn't being heard. It's a yes or no question, sir. Was it over and over and over again? Yes, because I wasn't being heard. Thank you, sir. I have no further questions. Any redirect? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Williams. I have a few more questions for you. Yes, sir. Um, in, in NMA, I'm sorry, in MMA fighting, 
Um, do you ever have a, a situation um, where your opponent is handcuffed behind the back? <laughs> Never. <laughs> do you ever have a situation in MMA where there are three people fighting against one? <laughs> Never. And um, when you were on the scene at 38th and Chicago on March on May 25th of last year, when you were watching this interaction between these three Minneapolis, four Minneapolis police officers and Mr. Floyd, were you watching a cage match at the time? Well, I only seen two of them, the animals. So I was watching more of a, a humane shit show. Okay. Objection. This is Sorry about what you said. That's okay. Okay. So you weren't watching a sport that day, were you? Not at all. Mr. Nelson asked you a couple times about this kind of blood choke around the throat. Are you, uh, based on your training, your experience, doing this yourself, can you apply a blood choke to one side of the neck? Correct. And is that done in mixed martial arts? That is done, correct. So whether Mr. Nelson wants to ask you about doing it on both sides of the neck, you've seen it done on one side of the neck? Correct. All right. And when you were on the street there at 38th and Chicago on May 25th of last year, watching Mr. Chauvin, uh, and Mr. Floyd, um, was it that kind of blood choke you thought you were seeing on one side of the neck? That is correct. Or Mr. Nelson asked you about um, seeing times when somebody has been uh, unconscious in a, in a mixed martial arts fight okay. and, and come to uh, and try to wrestle again, Good. or fight again. When an opponent is rendered unconscious through something like a chokehold in a mixed martial arts fight, uh, is the fight stopped? Right away, immediately, medical attention, right away. Mr. Nelson asked you about um, dealing with crowds that are upset in your experience as a security guard. Um, when you're dealing with a crowd that is upset, are there ways to try and de-escalate the situation without using force? That is correct. Like what kinds of things can you do? Uh, really staying calm, being humane, talking to the person, you know, trying to talk them down, um, just getting the person away from the situation, just being humane with the person. What worked for me in downtown Minneapolis, a security guard, and with drunk people that I'm babysitting pretty much. Like I can't, I have to come to and try to figure out a way how to solve this problem without putting physical force to them unless they are trying to physically enforce on me. So while you were on the street there on 38th in Chicago on May 25th of last year and watching Mr. Chauvin uh, hold Mr. Floyd down, did you see Officer Tao try to de-escalate that situation at all? With the crowd. Objection. Well, based on your training and experience as a security guard and, and your testimony just now about ways to de escalate the situation, did you see Tao doing anything like that while you were there on that scene? Same objection. Sustained. Sidebar.
Mr. Fair. When you're dealing with a crowd as a security guard, I mean, Earl, he hasn't finished the question. And um, you have, as Mr. Nelson described them, uh, a crowd that's upset. Would it help in your situation as a security guard to have others, other security guards present? Yes, it does. More presence, the better. During your cross-examination, you were asked about the time that Officer Tao touched you, put his hand on your his hand on your chest. Correct. And, and your reaction um, was was what? Uh, I immediately swiped his hand because I felt threatened, and then I stepped back and I put my hands forward, and I really was threatened by his presence. So you know, again, I put my hands up, didn't know what else was going to move forward, and I proceeded to step back. So I know you backed up to demonstrate, but if you could move back up. Oh, to the sorry. Yep. Oh, no problem. We, I think we heard you, so you're fine. Just got to stay close to the microphone. So you didn't want Officer Tao touching you. Not at all. And other than pushing his hand away, you didn't touch him. Not at all. We kind of just. And then you went back up on the curb. That is correct. During your cross examination, um, you used the term "the officer's retreat." What did you mean by that retreat? Uh, I'm, what I mean is I'm not a law enforcement or by any means, but I know when certain, I see when certain cases happen when it comes to certain things like this, most of the officers retreat away from the scene until all the right authorities come on scene to take care of everything. So, I, And that's what I, I noticed that they did. They retreated away from the scene to the, to the other side of the street, and that's where they stayed until whoever came and deal with them. Okay. Also during your uh, cross-examination, Mr. Nelson asked you about things that happened before you got to the scene. That's correct. You weren't at all trying to tell the jury in your previous testimony that you knew things that occurred before you got there. Nah, not at all. I was deer in the headlights. But when you got there, for that time period after you arrived and saw Mr. Chauvin with his knee on Mr. Floyd's neck on the ground there until the ambulance took him, you watched that entire time? I watched. Yeah, I watched everything. And so during that time that you were watching, did you see anything that you thought justified holding Mr. Floyd down that way? No at all. The answer is stricken. Hmm. Um, did you see um, Mr. Floyd um, fighting back to the officers? No. Did you see um, whether Mr. Floyd lost consciousness while you were there watching? Correct. Your Honor. Yep. No argument on objections. I'll ask for sidebar if I want objection or if I want argument. The objection is overruled. You may proceed. Ask the question again so Mr. Williams knows what it is. While you were there watching, was there a time when you saw Mr. Floyd lose consciousness? That is correct. Uh, we are referred to the fish. That's yeah. Yeah. You were asked multiple times about being angry. That's correct. And more and more upset as time went on. Correct. So why? Why did you get angry and more and more upset as time went on? Because, again, they were not listening to anything that I was telling them. Uh, I felt like I had to speak out for Floyd because he was speaking out to the officer and there was no feedback, no emotion, no nothing. Like, I literally looked in his eyes and as I'm talking what, to them. I mean, I'll just you know, yeah. stop you there. What, we're going uh, to stop the answer there. Next question. What did you think was happening to Mr. Floyd? Uh, he was under distress. That answer will stand, but move on from that. You felt he was in danger? Correct. 
Uh, in danger of what? Objection, Your Honor. Uh, Council Cyber. Mr. Frey. So, Mr. Williams, um, why did you think it was so important that you were not being heard? Uh, because I felt like with the side choke, you lose consciousness, and I felt like he was in the process of losing consciousness also from the condition of my fish yeah. in the bag. So, so. Uh, it's an overall you can continue oh, so like I said before earlier he reminded me of my fish in the bag so let me ask it this way then yeah, last, the last no will be stricken about the fish in the bag and Is so he, then I'm sorry so you were concerned about Mr. Floyd losing his life correct I have nothing further, Your Honor. Any recross? You were asked a series of questions on redirect about um, your experience in mixed martial arts, if you recall? Correct. Uh, can you tell me about any of the conversations that you had as you were being rendered under unconscious in any of your fights? Your Honor, I'm going to object. You're saying. What did you just ask me? Uh, what, did, what did you just no, ask Just wait. Let me rule on the objection first. The objection is overruled. You may answer if you have a recollection as to any time. Ask the question again, yes, but don't answer until I say so. When you were engaged in mixed martial arts in your fights, in your competitive fights, can you tell me, were you able to have a conversation with your opponent as you were being rendered unconscious? Yes or no? We're gonna talk to each other, so no. Nothing further. 
You said earlier you're not a medical doctor. That's totally correct. <clears throat> if Mr. Nelson is asking you whether a person can... Objection, Your Honor. Yeah. Stop. You're not allowed to give a medical opinion. Mr. Frank is going to ask you about your personal experience. If you have such a personal experience, you can talk about your personal experience. Uh, nothing more. Mr. Frank, please phrase it in terms of his personal uh, experience, not an opinion. I really Your Honor. In a mixed martial arts fight, when you are being rendered unconscious in a chokehold, you tap out, correct? Correct. And that's to prevent it from going too far. Correct, losing conscious. And the tap out is the communication you use to your opponent to say, hey, let up. That is correct. And your opponent has to follow that communication. That's correct. That's the rules of the fight. That's the rules of the fight. And so when you tap out, they know it's done and it stops. Correct. And only time you go verbally. That's, that's, that's the answer to the question. Right? I have nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Williams, you are excused. Thank you. Members of the jury, uh, our next four witnesses are going to be persons who, because of their age, I am allowing them not to be on the video broadcast. Obviously, you will be able to see them in the courthouse. But just so you know what is going out beyond this courtroom, their video will not be shown. Further, when they uh, give their name and spell their names for the record, that will be off the audio that is being broadcast outside this courtroom. Just so you know what the general public is seeing, you will of course see and hear everything. I'm also allowing, contrary to what is often in the rules of decorum that we operate under, that they can refer to other people who are at the scene by their first names, as opposed to Mr. or Ms. So uh, that's with court permission. They're not violating anything by doing so. So with that, uh, the state will be bringing in its next witness. There will be four in a row probably, we're not going to get to all of them before we take a break, probably one at most. Okay, thank you. Five minutes? Okay. Uh, well, why don't we just take our morning break for now? And if we have to take another one, we can do that as well. Uh, let's break for 20 minutes. Uh, we'll be back at. Okay. Change of plan. All right. We're ready to go with our first witness.
sound like you've got a nice loud voice that we'll be able to hear you at the microphone. If there's any problem, I'll maybe move you up or back, but it seems like you're doing just fine. So I'm going to turn it over, uh, going back on audio, uh, to Mr. Blackwell. Good morning, Good morning. Are you a little nervous up there? Yes. It's understandable. I'm just going to take uh, a few minutes this morning uh, to talk with you and uh, uh, give the jury a chance to hear from you about what you saw, how you reacted, and what happened on May 25th, okay? Yes. Uh, first of all, Darnella, would you tell us how old you are? I'm 18 years old. And uh, one week ago, were you 18 years old? No. Uh, so you just had a birthday? Yes. And so when we talk about uh, May 25th of last year, you were? 17. Are you a student? Yes. Uh, tell us, where do you go to, are you in high school? Yes. Where do you go to high school? Um, ninth through 11th, I went to Roosevelt High School, then made the decision to switch to Augsburg Fairview Academy for my 12th grade year. So you most certainly remember the date of May 25th of last year. Yes. Uh, I want to take you to a certain time period on May 25th, at around 7 o'clock uh, p.m. on May 25th. Do you recall walking to Cup Foods? Yes. And were you by yourself? No. Uh, were you walking with a cousin of yours? Yes. Uh, do you recall how old your cousin was? Mm. Maybe 12, I'm not sure. Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe. <laughs> uh, now you're walking to Cup Foods. Where were you walking from? Home. So you live nearby? Yes. Uh, would you uh, describe Cup Foods as the neighborhood store? Yes. Now the jury may have heard something about this being a dangerous neighborhood. Uh, were you concerned for your safety in walking with your cousin to Cup Foods? No. If you had to estimate, how many times would you say you walked to Cup Foods from your home in the neighborhood? Hundreds, so maybe even thousands. So you and your cousin walk into Cup Foods. What were you going there for? Do you remember? I was taking her to get some snacks. Your cousin loves snacks. Yes. <laughs> so let's go to uh, May 25th of uh, 2020, and I want to show you a couple of things just to uh, set the scene for our discussion. Uh, I want to show you uh, what's been marked for identification purposes, for our purposes, as Exhibit 13. On exhibit 13, do you suit two people in that, uh, in what is a photograph? Yes, but I also see two people back there, if that oh, counts. See. Right, you see two people in the front of the photo and two people in the back. Yes. Is this photo a true and accurate uh, depiction of you and your cousin yes. in the front of the photograph on, on uh, May 25th? Yes. The honor off for exhibit 13 in evidence. Mm -hmm. No objection, Your Honor. 13 is received. Would you like me to publish? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Now, the jury can see it, too. Now, this is a screen that you can actually uh, mark on. And uh, so if we see the two people that are right here in the front of this picture, there's a little girl with the word love on her sweatshirt, and there's another person next to her. One of those persons, you? Yes. And, uh, and which one? The bigger one or the little one? The bigger one. And, uh, and this is your, your cousin next to you? Yes. And, uh, and is this as you walk into uh, to Cup Foods? Yes. I want to show you what we've marked as Exhibit 16 uh, for the trial.
If you could pull that up, Brad. Now, is this the uh, a, a video that you've seen before? Yes. Uh, do you uh, have personal knowledge of the scene that's depicted in this exhibit? Yes. Uh, is this video a true and accurate depiction of the scene that you saw on May 25th of 2020? Yes. Your Honor, the state offers exhibit 16 in that. Objection. 16 is received. Right. So, Mr. LT, if you could uh, play this a little ways, uh, I want to ask you some questions about it. So we can see with the jury, uh, two people walking from the left to the right. There's a little girl in the green shirt, and there you are. Do you see? You? Yes. And is this as you all were approaching Cup Foods on May 25th? Yes. Now see there, your cousin goes into the store. Why did she go into the store, and then you turned around and then came back toward the squat cars? I wanted to make sure she got in. You can stop there, uh, Brad, for a second. Uh, when you walk past the squad car uh, there, did you see anything happening there on the ground as you were walking towards Cup Foods with your cousin? Yes, I see a man on the ground, and I see a cop kneeling down on him. Was there anything about the scene that you didn't want your cousin to see? Yes. And what was that? A man terrified, scared, begging for his life. Is that why you directed your cousin to going into Cup Foods? Yes. And uh, and then when you saw what was happening there at the scene, what was it about the scene that caused you to come back? It wasn't right. He was he was suffering. He was in pain. Let me stop you there for just a second, uh, Darnell. And so when you say, first of all, he, are you referring to the person you come to know as George Floyd? Yes. Uh, did you know anything about Mr. George Floyd before May 25th? No. Had you ever met him before? No. Ever seen him before to your knowledge? No. So when you came back uh, to this scene here that we can see in Exhibit uh, 16, what did you do when you first got there and we see where you're standing? What did you do? I pulled out my phone. And what were you doing to pull out your phone? Recording and capturing what I was seeing. And uh, we have uh, already admitted into evidence in this case uh, the video which you had done, which was our Exhibit 15 that's in evidence. Um, so tell the jury what you observed what you heard uh, when you stopped to look at what was happening there at the scene? I heard George Floyd saying, <clears throat> I can't breathe, please get off of me. I can't breathe. He, he cried for his mom. He was in pain. It seemed like he knew. It seemed like he knew it was over for him. He was terrified. He was suffering. This was a cry for help. Definitely. Yeah. You don't disregard any opinions about how Mr. Floyd was feeling, but you can rely on her observations. Good. Mr. Blackwell. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Donna, let me show you uh, for a moment. We'll come back to this discussion. Let me show you Exhibit 17. Uh, that's also already in evidence. Uh, So can you see um, the person depicted on Exhibit 17? Yes. Uh, Darnella, are you able to tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury if you know who this man is? <laughs> you can take your time. Yes, yes. Uh, please tell the ladies and gentlemen, who is this? This was the officer that was kneeling on George Floyd's neck. On May 25th? Yes. Is this the way he appeared when you saw him on May 25th, kneeling on George Floyd's neck? Yes. We 
when you first arrived at the at the scene, you can take that now, Brett. When you first arrived at the scene and you started recording with your phone uh, camera. Uh, were there other bystanders or others there present at the time? No. Uh, about how long before other people started to gather with it? Not even a minute in. And uh, could you estimate roughly how many others were just there around you who were also observing what was happening? Maybe about 12, 14, something around that maybe. If I showed you a, a picture of those who were there, might you recognize uh, those who might have been present with you. Let's see. Uh, Brady full of exhibit 184. Thank you. Fresh memory, is that correct? Uh, yes, John. Just one moment. Let me uh, make sure it's just uh, that only that she can see. I've already got it. All right. Thank you, John. Um, as you look at exhibit 184, uh, do these look like in this uh, exhibit the other bystanders who were with you at the scene on May 25th? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, offer 184 with that. Any objection? No objection. 184 with you. So we're looking at this um, picture, photograph at 184. Can you identify for us any of the other uh, bystanders? We know that you identify your, your cousin to the right. Uh, how about any of the people, others here in the, in the photograph? This is a former friend. This is a friend I went to school with, Alyssa. Would you, would you just point her out so that we can, you can mark on the screen, actually? Right there. I'm oh, sorry, the arrow was on I'm sorry, Judge, could you repeat that? The arrow is on the screen. The arrow's on Where's the screen. Point? Yeah, just one moment, uh, yeah. Uh, is she able to mark from where she is? She did, she put the arrow. She put the arrow on the screen okay. to mark where her friend is, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. You see the arrow, Mr. Blackwell? Yeah, no, I can't see anything on the screen here at all. Um, Um, you mentioned there's another one of your friends in the picture? Yes. And uh, what was the friend's name? Alyssa. And, uh, and could you again point out Alyssa? Okay, now I see it. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Um, and uh, what about uh, any, other, any other person you know here? Not on the scene, but I do know people that was there at the like, last minute. I know some of the workers because I've lived there for a while. But uh, you were there the whole time as these various group of bystanders gathered together on May 25th. Yes. Uh, if somebody were to tell uh, the ladies and gentlemen of this jury that you and the rest of the bystanders who were there were an unruly crowd, or mob. I didn't finish the question yet. I could better. Uh, I don't think it could be a non leading So let's rephrase as a non leading question, please. All right. Uh, I want you to describe uh, the, uh, the nature and character of the persons gathered together there. Would you describe yourselves as an unruly mob or an unruly crowd? This is Dan. Now, overall, I think it's the only way to get an answer. Is however, I will let the right after this answer. Go ahead. No, I would say everyone were reacting multiple different ways from what they were seeing, which it wasn't right. We all know it wasn't right. The last part of the answer is stricken. I'd like a sidebar with counsel.
right. Sorry, the technical difficulties are sending shooting pains in all of our ears. Yes. Mr. Blackwell, if you would. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. So as you were there with the other bystanders, did any of these bystanders ever threaten the police? No. Uh, did uh, any of them ever physically get violent with the police? No. Uh, did you at the scene on May 25th see any violence at the scene at all anywhere? Yes, from the cops, from Chauvin, and from Officer Tao. Um, I think that's his name. Other than, other than the violence you saw from Mr. Chauvin and the other police, did you see any act of violence from the bystanders who were there? No. Uh, did you see any of the bystanders that act in any way that you would describe as unruly? No. Uh, do you think it's fair to call them a mob? No. Amongst the bystanders who were there, did you see any of them make an effort to actually offer care for Mr. Floyd? Physically? Yes. Um, I seen, I heard them say, get off of him. You're hurting him. He can't breathe. He's not moving. But anytime someone tried to get close, they were defensive, so we couldn't even get close. So first, let's just stick with what you heard the bystanders. The bystanders were saying things to Mr. Chauvin? Yes. Um, what things did you hear that were being said to Mr. Chauvin by the bystanders? You're hurting him. Are you enjoying this? He can't breathe. He's not moving. His nose is bleeding. You're a bum. Um, pretty much words around that category. And when you arrived at the scene, can you describe for us, first of all, what was the position, the position of Mr. Floyd when you arrived uh, at this scene and saw him by the squad car? He was laid down on the ground, restrained. It didn't look like he could move much, but his head and by restrained, was he in handcuffs? Yes. Uh, by restrained, uh, where was Mr. Chauvin in relation to Mr. Floyd? He was, his knee was kneeling on his neck. It was two other officers holding him down as well. And what did you hear or see Mr. Floyd doing while he was being restrained underneath, as you described, the knee of Mr. Chauvin? He was complaining about he was stating that he was in pain he said his neck his back everything hurts i can't breathe mom i he he said i would get up if i could something around that i wouldn't say that's his exact words um but yeah pretty much he was saying how much in pain he was he couldn't breathe At some point, was there a person who came to the scene who identified herself as a firefighter? Yes. Uh, are you able to see her in this Exhibit 184? Yes. Could you point to her? Okay, and let the record reflect she's pointed to Genevieve Hanson. Uh, as far as the name, she's identified who she believes is the firefighter. Oh, she didn't testify yet. The record will reflect that the witness has identified the person in, in dressed in black holding up a phone with a white headband in Exhibit 184. When this uh, person uh, who identified herself as a firefighter came, what did she do? She asked them to check his pulse. Who did she ask to check? Chauvin. And he asked, she asked Officer Chauvin to check the pulse of Mr. Floyd. Yes. Then what happened? He remained kneeling on his neck. And she asked multiple times, not just once. And then what did she do? Did she try to check his pulse? No, they wouldn't even let us get close. 
And what prevented your getting close when you say they wouldn't let us get close? They were quick to pull out mace. Who pulled out mace? Officer Tao and Chauvin. I don't, he put his hand on his mace. They put their hand on their mace. I can't remember if they actually pointed at us, but they definitely put their hand on the mace and we all backed back. Did you feel threatened by the police officers? Yes. Did you feel threatened by Mr. Shaw? Yes. Why is that? He seemed like, how do I word this? I felt like I was in danger when he did that. He rubbed me the wrong way. I didn't understand why they would do that. What we did for them to make us to make them do that. That's why I felt threatened. I don't understand why the mace was even needed at all. So as you were observing Mr. Floyd under the knee of Mr. Chauvin, did you ever see Mr. Chauvin do anything to offer care to Mr. Floyd? No. Uh, did he ever either let up or get up so that he could breathe? No. Uh, did you ever see him try to administer CPR? No. Uh, did you see him call anyone else to administer aid to Mr. Floyd? No. Did he call out and ask if anybody amongst the bystanders knew CPR who might be able to help him? Not at all. Uh, at what point did you see well, let me ask this. Did an ambulance at some point arrive at the, at the scene? Yes. And you saw the ambulance arrive there? Yes. Uh, roughly how many minutes uh, after you first started watching what was happening to Mr. Floyd did the ambulance show up? The end of my video, the video was about 10 minutes. I would say maybe somewhere around nine. I'm not sure. So was there any point in your video where there's nine or 10 minutes that Mr. Chauvin ever let up or got up off of the neck of Mr. Floyd that you saw? No, if anything, he actually was kneeling harder. It looked like he was shoving his knee in his neck. Like he was, yeah. So was it your experience then as the bystanders cried out that Mr. Chauvin kneeled in even harder? Is that what you're saying? Can you rephrase that? You, you, you told us that it looked like Mr. Chauvin was kneeling in even harder yes. on Mr. Floyd. Was there anything that that was in response to that he was kneeling harder? I feel like he was feeding off of our energy. Calls for speculation. I want to also, know. Uh, should we take our morning break at this time? Yes, sir. All right. Members of the jury, we're going to break until 11.15. Uh, we're in recess.
Ja, gør det. Jeg vil jo gerne sige, at det er en tanke. En drøm. En, en ambition. ambition.
Uh, members of the jury, we uh, sorry for the little bit of a delay. We had a legal issue that we had to deal with, and also I, we think we fixed this so that we're not going to blow our ears out next time. Let's hope. Mr. Blackwell, if you would. Thank you, Ron. Donald, before the break, uh, let me just bring you back to where we were. Uh, you had given us testimony to the fact that you saw from time to time Mr. Chavez and Neil Parker. Yes. Do you remember that testimony? Yes. Uh, could you tell the ladies and jury, members of the jury, how did you see him respond and react to the crowds calling out to him? What did you see him do? He just stared at us, looked at us. It, he had like this cold look, heartless. He didn't care. It seemed, it seemed as if he didn't care what we were saying. It didn't change anything he was doing. In response to what uh, you and the other bystanders were saying, did you see him do anything differently to the body of George Floyd? Can you re... Well, <clears throat> I'll just ask you the question, yes. In response to what the crowd was doing or saying, did you see him at any time kneel in harder on George Floyd in response? Yes. Incidentally, do you see Mr. Chauvin in the courtroom? Yes. Today? Could you please point him out? Right there. Yeah, for the record, she's pointed to Mr. Shop. Okay. Thank you. Now, you had at some point uh, told us that you were there when the ambulance came. Yes. Uh, did Mr. Chauvin get off of Mr. Floyd when the ambulance arrived? No, the ambulance person had to actually tell him to lift up. Um, so the ambulance arrives, and does an ambulance person get out right away and come over to ask Mr. Chauvin to lift up, or did something else happen before that? He checked his pulse first while Chauvin's knee was still remained on George Floyd's neck. All right, so paramedic checks his pulse with Mr. Chauvin still on his neck. Then what happened uh, after that? The paramedic was, he did like a motion, like get up telling him, basically telling him to remove his knee. His knee was still there, even when they came, even at the end, even unresponsive. Right. And is it, did Mr. Chauvin get up at that time then? Yes. Right. As you were observing uh, the, the entire scene, did you observe Mr. Floyd do anything that you felt was threatening to any of the police officers? No. Um, did you see him do anything other than call out uh, in anguish. No, besides maybe trying to get more comfortable, no. Do you feel, well, let me, let me ask the question a different way. Uh, when you arrived at the scene, uh, you heard Mr. Floyd uh, crying out, you told us. Yes, from afar. Uh, at some point, during the period of time when he was under Mr. Chauvin's knees, did you see him go unconscious? Yes. Uh, did you hear any discussion about whether or not he had in fact died? No. Uh, did you have, well, when the, the paramedics came, uh, they picked up his body, they took his body from the scene? Yes. Did they revive him there? No. Uh, did you ever see him conscious again when he left the scene, before he left the scene? No. Incidentally, with the, the photograph here of the, the bystanders, the Exhibit 184 that's in front of you, uh, did the bystanders for the most part stay there on the sidewalk where they were? For the most part, yes. Uh, if they stepped uh, at all into the, if they stepped at all into the street, uh, was there an officer there telling them to get back? Yes. Uh, did you uh, see that the bystanders complied with what the officer was asking to get back? Yes. You know, I'll pass away. Ms. Mills. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Just have a few questions for you, okay? Okay. Um, you testified that um, when you first came up to Cup Foods, you heard, you initially heard what was being said by Mr. Floyd, right? Yes. And you sent your cousin into the store, and you never went into Cup Foods yourself, right? Correct. And you turned around, and you pretty much right away from the time you sent your cousin into the store, right away started recording, right? Correct. And ultimately, you recorded from, the, from that point all the way until the, shortly after the paramedics came and left, right? Correct. All right. And so it's fair to say that prior to, well, as you approached them, uh, Mr. Floyd was already in that position, right? Yes. He was on the ground. Yes. And anything that happened prior to that, you wouldn't be privy to or know what happened, right? Correct. But you, um, and so what we saw from your video that has been played was roughly 10 minutes of time, agreed? Agree. Okay. And throughout the course of your time that you were recording, you, can, you would agree that when we watch the video, there are times we can hear your voice, right? Correct. And we can hear the voices of the other people, the bystanders, so to speak, right? Yes. And I believe that you said there were about 12, by the end, there were about 12 to 14 people that were standing kind of right there on the sidewalk, right? Correct. Um, were you also observing people across the street? No. Were you observing people like down uh, on the other side of 38th? No, mainly focused on what I was saying. Right. Um, you would agree that that intersection is a fairly busy intersection, lots of traffic? Um, certain days, yes, it could be. Yeah, I mean, at times, right? Yes. It's a bus route, there's buses coming by. It's right? been multiple times, it's been empty though, as well, but yeah. Understood, right. It's a, But it's a, it's a busier intersection, it's in the middle of the city, right? It's compared to like in a neighborhood. Like in a, where there's all houses, more traffic there, right? Yes. And in fact, in your video, we can actually see a lot of cars driving by because this was, you know, a nice spring night, right? Yes. And so, um, your video, in other words, sort of speaks for itself, right? What we see on it is what you were watching as you watched it. Correct. Correct. Okay. You, you were interviewed by, I believe, a couple of Bureau of Criminal Apprehension agents early on in the case, right? Um, who? The BCA, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. They came and took a statement from you? Yes. Okay. If us, the FBI? The, well, there was there an FBI agent Let's call them law enforcement, all right? There were a couple of law enforcement agents that interviewed you. Closer to the situation, yes. It was two, I believe two white guys. I'm not sure if they were white, but they looked white. Sure. But yes, closer to the situation, yes. Right. Um, you met with them, you provided them your cell phone, and you, yes. you allowed them to, to copy the video from your cell phone for uh, purposes of their investigation, right? Yes. And at that time, they took a statement from you. Would you agree with that? Yes. And you understand that that statement was recorded, right? Yes. Okay. Um, now, I, I don't wanna misphrase what you said before, but I thought I heard you say that you were aware that there were four officers on the scene when you walked up. No. I didn't see the other officers until the end. And when I seen, when everything blowed up, I've seen 
um, different angles. That's when I figured out it was two other, it was, yeah, two other officers on George Floyd when right. he was laying on the ground. The, the question being though, however, as you were filming it, you were not aware that those other two officers were there. No, only officer I seen was Chauvin and Officer Tao. Right, and those are the two that you, you primarily had interactions with Officer Tao, right? Yes. And you testified that Officer Chauvin didn't say very much, right? Yes. But it's also fair to say that you you couldn't necessarily hear whether those other officers were speaking to Mr. Chauvin. Objection, Your Honor, is assuming facts that are not established. Overruled. You can answer if you know. You haven't asked the question again? I heard him. Okay. No, I did not hear the other officers. Right. And it's also fair to say that when you first started recording, um, you were one of the few people that were there, right? I was the first, first person to record. Right. First person, yeah, sure. And by the end of the video, there were more people present. Yes. And would you agree that initially when you started recording, you weren't saying much, if anything, to the officers, right? I don't remember. But as time went on and more people showed up, voices became louder. Would you agree with that? As we understood more what was happening. It, it's, I just want to know. What we seen right. is how we reacted. Right. Like you said, the video speaks for itself. Understood, and I appreciate that. So you, you heard pe various people calling the officers' names, right? Yes. And the volume of the, the people in the that were bystanders grew louder over time. Would you agree with that? Yes, more so as he was becoming more unresponsive. unresponsive. And, and um, more people also started speaking at the same time, right? Yes. So we had, you said there were 12 to 14 people. Around that. Around that number, I think I counted 12 in the picture. Okay. Um, and several of them were speaking. Would you agree with that? Yes. And several of them were yelling. Yes. And they were becoming more and more upset based upon what they saw. Correct. Do you remember Officer Tao saying to you, if you can breathe, you can breathe if you can talk? Yes. Now, in addition to, um, in addition to your uh, initial interview with law enforcement officers, you've also met with the prosecution team a couple of times in preparation for trial, right? Who would that be? Well, like uh, Mr. Allison, Mr. Blackwell, Mr. Frank, Mr. Slisher, and a host of others, right? Correct. Okay. And you were, um, you grew up in uh, in the near, nearby neighborhood, right? I'm from here. I grew up near the suburbs. Okay. Um, but you were at the time living... At the time I've been there for years. Yes, correct. For how many years did you say? Maybe, I don't know, five plus. Okay. And um, you attended Roosevelt High School at the time? Yes. And um, you testified that you felt safe, you know, walking to the store. Actually, sorry. At the time of this, I'm not sure if I attended Roosevelt because I was in the process of switching schools. Okay. Uh, I think we were, it was during the pandemic, right? And so everybody kind of had, all of a sudden you had to study from home kind of a thing, right? I was already at my other school. Okay. So yes. Yeah. Um, 
you testified that you've walked to Cup Foods hundreds, if not thousands, of times. Correct. And that you felt safe doing so. Every, any time of the night, I would walk there. Okay. Um, would you agree that you had previously told uh, members of the prosecution team that at night the neighborhood can be a little bit more dangerous? Some nights, I mean, wasn't really known for violence like every night or a lot, a lot, but I feel like any area has some type of crime sure. from here and there. Sure, understood. And I'm not trying to disparage it, the neighborhood, right? Um, I'm just asking what you had told the prosecution before. Right. All right. Um, you ultimately ended up posting your video to social media, right? Correct. And it went viral? Correct. And was that a surprise to you? Definitely. Right. Changed your life, right? Beyond objectives, beyond the scope of practice, bro. Overall. Are you asking me? Yes, it changed your life. It has. Your Honor, I have no further questions for this witness. Any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Blackwell. <clears throat> Donella, you had just been asked questions about the safety of your neighborhood at night. On May 25th, when you were there, were you there at Cup Foods at night? No. Sun was out, you could see fine. Correct. Uh, you were also asked whether or not you were aware of what people were across the street from where the officers were, what people were on the other side of 38th Street. Remember uh, Mr. Nelson asking you about that? Correct. Did you see anybody from across the street or from 38th Street do anything to either attack or threaten Mr. Shop? No. And do you think if somebody came across the street to attack or threaten Mr. Shaman, you had your camera going, you'd have recorded it? Correct. Um, now, he asked some questions about, uh, again, the bystanders um, who were there, and he talked with you about that, those bystanders. Uh, did you see a single thing that indicated to you that Mr. Shopman was afraid of you, your little cousin, or a single one of the bystanders? No. You were asked about cars on the street. There are cars and cars and cars going. Did you notice, was Mr. Shopman trying to get out of the way of cars? No. You were also asked about what the officers might have been saying to Mr. Shopman. Correct. Remember talking about that? Yes. Did you hear the officers, did you hear any of the officers tell Mr. Chauvin that Mr. Floyd didn't have a pulse? Did you hear him say that even? No. You didn't hear him say anything? No. And you were also asked questions about how, uh, as the events went on on May 25th, how you uh, and others may have gotten louder. Correct. Uh, Darnell, are you the sort of person who in response to seeing somebody being potentially harmed on the street gets loud? Mm. I'm more of a, I bottle things up. I feel things inside. I don't, I have social anxiety. So it's really, it's really out of my comfort zone to really be that out person. But, you know, when I seen what I saw, at moments I worked, I was loud. Loud in response to what you saw? Correct. Now, Mr. Nelson asked you a few questions about your video going viral and how that's changed your life. Remember that at the end? Yes. Uh, would you tell the ladies and gentlemen how you're viewing, experiencing what happened to George Floyd has affected your life? When I look at George Floyd, I look at I look at my dad, I look at my brothers, I look at my cousins, my uncles, because they are all black. 
I have black I have a black father, I have a black brother, I have black friends. And I I look at that and I look at how that could have been one of them. It's been nights. I stayed up apologizing and and apologizing to George Floyd for not doing more and not physically interacting and not saving his life, but it's like, it's not what I should have done. It's what he should have done. He should have. That's the answer, thank you. Did you finish your answer, Donnell? She finished her answer. Yeah, thank you. Proceed to your next question. No, Your Honor, that's my last question. Thank you, Donnell. Mr. Nelson. All right, thank you. You may step down. You can leave, thank you. All right, next witness for the state is coming. All right. And Mr. Blackwell, if you would. Thank you, Ron. Good morning, Judea. Good morning. Uh, first of all, uh, would you tell us how old you are? Nine. Uh, how old will you be by the end of next week? Ten. And then you've got a tenth birthday coming up. Yes. What grade are you in? Third. Do you have a cousin named Darnell? Yes. Uh, do you remember going with her sometime last year in May? Yeah. To, you went, you have to let me finish my question, but do you remember going with her uh, to Cup Foods? Yes. And uh, you like going to Cup Foods to buy snacks? Yes. Uh, did you go with your cousin Darnella sometime in May of last year to get snacks? 
Yeah. Let me show you what's uh, Exhibit 14. No? No, that Okay, I'm showing you what's been uh, marked as uh, our exhibit number 13 and asking, can you see the two people yes. in the front of that picture? Can you? Yeah. Who are those people? Me and my cousin. And uh, which one is you? All right. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, the little one with the word love on her shirt. Yes. Now you, um, you that day, you went into Cup Foods to get to get your snacks. Yeah. And when you came out of the the Cup Foods, do you remember what you did next when you came out? Uh, I saw the officer put a knee on neck on George Floyd. Okay. Now you mentioned someone named George Floyd. Yes. Uh, did you know George Floyd before May twenty fifth? I can't hear. It. I, could you say that again? You can't hear? No. Okay. Had you ever met George Floyd before uh, no. going into Cup Foods that day? No. Uh, as far as you know, had you ever seen him? No. Now, when you uh, came out to where your cousin was and you saw jo George Floyd, was there a policeman there? Yes. Uh, do you remember what the policeman or policemen were doing? Putting a knee on neck with George Floyd. Uh, if I showed you a picture of a policeman, why don't I just do that? Let me ask you if you recognize the policeman in what's marked as Exhibit 17. Do you recognize this man? Yes. Um, who is he? I can't remember his name. Do you remember what he was doing? How do you know him? He was pushing me on the neck with George Floyd. Do you see him in the courtroom today? No. Okay. How about him? Yes. All right. So is that the person then you, you saw? Yes. Uh, so you saw a knee being put uh, on the neck of George Floyd. When was the knee taken? Did you see that the knee was ever taken off of George Floyd's neck? No. Uh, were you there when an ambulance came? Yes. Tell us what happened after you saw the ambulance come. Yes, the ambulance had to push him off of him. And how did that happen? Did they simply come in an ambulance and then go up to push him off, or what happened? They asked him nicely to get off of him. And when they asked him nicely to get off of him, what did he do? He still stayed on him. And then what happened after he still stayed on him, what did the ambulance people do? They just had to put him off, get off of him. Uh, are you able to, to tell us, having been there on this day and seeing the, the officer on top of George Floyd, how did you feel about that? How did it affect you? I was sad and kind of mad. And, and tell us, why were you sad and mad? Because it felt like he was stopping his breathing and it is kind of like hurting him. Thank you, Judea. I want to ask you any other questions. Mr. Nelson. I have no questions for this question. Thank you. Judea, you can uh, go. You are excused, so you're done testifying.
All right. Uh, members of the jury, uh, lunches might not be here until 12.30, but uh, let's shoot for 1.15 to reconvene. So we are in recess until 1.15. Thank you.
show you. She she wanted a picture of herself taking that ski on. And if you could uh, turn towards me and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm, under penalty of perjury, that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? Yes. Okay. And we're going to go off the audio, which means it's not going to be broadcast. Good afternoon, Alyssa. Hello. How old are you? I'm 18. And are you currently a high school student? Yes. What grade are you in? 12th grade. And do you also have a part-time job in a retail or a retail pharmacy? Yes. And what city do you live in? Minneapolis. Have you lived in Minneapolis your whole life? Yes. And in terms of your general neighborhood, do you live relatively close to Cup Foods? In the area. So I'm going to ask you some questions about Memorial Day, May 25th of last year, okay? Okay. What were you doing that evening? Um, I was going to the corner store to get an aux cord for my car. And when you say corner store, what store is that? Cup Foods. And you said you were going to get an aux cord. Can you just explain what that is? Like a cord to play music on the radio. And um, you called Cup Foods the corner store. Did you go there often? Um, not like a lot, but if I was around. I'd go there for like snacks or something. So you had been there before? Yes. And who were you with that day? Kaylin. And who's Kaylin? Is she a friend? Yeah. And how did you get to Cup Foods that day? Um, I drove my grandfather's vehicle. What kind of car is that? A 2003 Buick Century. And what color is it? Tan. And you said you drove, um, so you were in the driver's seat driving the car that day? Yes. And who, you said Kaylin was with you, where was she in the car? Uh, the passenger. So she was in the front passenger seat? Yes. Okay. And at that time, Memorial Day of last year, how old were you then? 17. So you talked about going to get an aux cord at the corner store at Cup Foods, and you were in your grandpa's car. What did you see when you first pulled up 
in front of Cup Foods? Um, I had seen that there was some police cars. Um, I just were, I was just looking for somewhere to park, so. So when you said you were looking for somewhere to park, you said you saw a police car. Did you see anything else? No. Did you get to park the car after you first pulled up? Yes. And where did you park? Um, a couple of feet in front of the bus stop. And I'm going to put up Exhibit 1, which has already been admitted. Now, if you look in front of you, you can see a map. Um, can you sort of circle or point with your finger on that screen in front of you about the area where you parked your car? All right, and you said in front of the bus stop, right next to that little circle you put, does that, is that the bus stop that you're talking about? Yeah. So you, you said you parked your car. What'd you do at that point? Um, I told my friend to stay in the car because I didn't really know what was going on and I originally was just still going in to get a charger or an aux cord. So um, I got out the car and started walking towards the store. Okay, so what first, you said you didn't really know what was going on. Was yeah. there something that drew your attention somewhere? Um, yes, right before I walked in the door I saw um, there was four police officers and um, George outside. And when you say George, uh, who's George? Um, the black male on the ground. Did you know who he was at that point in time? No. Did you later learn his name? Yes. And are you talking about George Floyd? Yes. So you saw a black male that you later learned to be Mr. Floyd on the ground and some officers did you hear what was going on at that point? Um, I heard a couple, there was already a couple bystanders there, and I just heard um, some people talking to let him up and just to stay calm, talking to George. Um, yeah. And did you hear who you're talking about, George, Mr. Floyd? Did you hear Mr. Floyd saying anything? Uh, yes, I heard him say he couldn't breathe and that his stomach hurt and that he wanted his mom. Did you have um, your friend Kaylin's phone with you when you got out of the car? Yes, I did. So when you heard all these things going on, what did you decide to do with that phone? Um, I knew initially that there was something wrong. So I started recording. So you said you knew something was wrong. What made you think something was wrong? Well, a lot of people looked in distress on the sidewalk. And um, George was in distress. And when you say he was in distress, was it those things you heard him saying that made you think he was in distress? Yes. OK. So was that what prompted you to start to record? Yes. And could you see what was going on with Mr. Floyd at that point? Yes, I could see that he was um, being held to the ground. And what did you see with respect to how he was being held to the ground? I saw that uh, Derek had his knee on his neck and two other officers had his body pinned down. So when you say Derek, are you referring to Derek Chauvin? Yes. Um, so you saw Mr. Chauvin with a knee on Mr. Floyd's neck, is that right? Yes. And then you said there were other officers. What were, what were those officers doing that you could see? Um, they were like holding him down, his lower half of his body. And in terms of George Floyd's condition, how did he look to you when you saw him? He looked like he was struggling at first and um, he looked distressed and he looked like he was fighting to breathe. So when you say struggling and, and fighting to breathe and in distress, um, did it look like he was getting into a physical fight with the officers or did it look like he was struggling in terms of his ability to breathe? 
He was struggling with his ability to breathe. He was focused on trying to breathe. Okay. And how could you tell that from your perspective where, where you were? Um, well, at first he was vocal and he got less vocal and you could tell um, he was talking with like small, smaller and smaller breaths and he'd spit a little and he'd talk and he try and move his head to because he was uncomfortable. And you said he was getting less and less vocal. Was there? Um, did you become more concerned over time? Yes. And why was that that you became more concerned or worried? Because I slowly knew that um, if they were, if he were to be held down much longer, he wouldn't live. And what made you think that? Um, because he was, you could see in his face that he was slowly not being able to breathe. His eyes were rolling back. And um, at one point, he just kind of sat there. And when you I say, laid there. sorry, when you say he just kind of sat there or laid there, um, did you notice a change in his ability to speak or, or make sounds? Yes. And take your time. If you need a tissue, there's some right there. Is this difficult for you to talk about? Yeah. Do you need a minute? And Alyssa, why is this difficult for you to talk about? Um, it was difficult because I felt like there wasn't really anything I could do as a bystander. The highest power was there and I felt like I was feeling it. I'm sorry, you said you felt like you were feeling it? Well, like failing to do anything. Oh, you said fa failing, I, I hear you now. Um, why did you feel like you were failing? Because I was there and I, like, technically I could have did something, but I couldn't really do anything physically what I wanted to do because the highest power was there at the time. So when you say you couldn't do physically what you wanted to do, can you explain why you felt you couldn't? get involved? Um, there was another police officer kind of like pushing the crowd back, making sure he everyone was on the sidewalk and didn't get close. So did you feel like that officer was stopping you from being able to get closer? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, did you at some point see any of the officers um, check for a pulse on Mr. Floyd? Um, I'm not really sure. Okay. What did you see the other officers do? Um, well, they kind of just stood in this, or kneeled at the same position, holding him down. No one really moved that much that was on Floyd. And did you hear people around you, bystanders, asking about a pulse? Yes. And when you heard people ask about a pulse, did anything about what the officers were doing change at that point? No, no one responded. Did they move their bodies off Mr. Floyd? No. Did they get up at that point? No. Did Mr. Chauvin get up at that point? No. Did so? Was Mr. Chauvin's knee still on top of Mr. Floyd at that point? Yes, his knee remained on him the entire time till paramedics came. Okay. Um, and did you um, get a chance to look at Mr. Chauvin while you were there? Uh, yes, um, I did look at him. And what, um, what was he doing? Where was he looking? Um, most of the time I saw him staring at George. 
I didn't really see him take his eyes off of him for the most part. Did you notice anything about what Mr. Chauvin was doing with his body? Yes, at one point I saw him put more and more weight onto him. And how could you tell that? Um, I saw his back foot or leg lift off the ground and his hands go in his pocket. So, can you just describe a little more what you saw? What you, you know, you're describing the leg movement and what you're describing as a hand in the pocket. What did you see change about the way Mr. Chauvin's body position was to make you think that? Um, could you repeat the question? Sorry, it was a bad question. How, how, did, how did it change? How did what Mr. Chauvin was doing make it look to you like he was putting more weight on, on Mr. Floyd? Um, I kind of saw him move his knee down more. Okay. Make so little movements. And when you say you saw Mr. Chauvin's knee move down more, what is what are you talking about? Down into Mr. Floyd or down somewhere else? Down into Mr. Floyd's neck. Okay. And what were you doing while you were watching all of this happen? Um, I was recording and I was telling him to get off of him and I was um, expressing that I was upset. And what made you upset about this situation? He wasn't able to breathe and they weren't, I felt like they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. Objection. Last part of the answer is stricken. All right, so at some point did you see an ambulance arrive? Yes. And you said that you had seen Mr. Chauvin on top of Mr. Floyd until the ambulance arrived. What else did you see happen when the ambulance arrived? Um, I saw that they, well, the police officers didn't move, and Chauvin kept his knee on his neck the entire time, even when the paramedic was checking for a pulse. Did you see paramedics check for a pulse? Yes. And um, what was happening that you saw at that point in time? Um, they were checking his pulse for on his neck. Okay, so you saw a paramedic touch Mr. Floyd's neck? Yes. And was it at that point you said that Mr. Chauvin was still on Mr. Floyd's neck? Yes. After that, at some point, did um, did the paramedics move Mr. Floyd's body? Yes. And was that the first time that you saw Mr. Chauvin get off Mr. Floyd's neck? Yes. At any time before the ambulance came, um, did you see any officers or Mr. Chauvin uh, attempt to, uh, to to move in any way, move Mr. Floyd or give any medical assistance in any way? No. Did you see anybody? give him CPR, or roll him over, or anything like that? No. And then you talked about um, there, there were other people who were on the curb with you, other bystanders. Um, what were those people doing throughout this process? Um, they were also um, expressing how they felt about the situation as well, and I'm, um, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm aware that there was other people recording. Okay, but um, were you all on the curb essentially in sort of a, a group together? Yes. And did anybody um, get in close contact with Mr. Floyd's body? Did anybody get close? No. Okay. I'm going to put up exhibit 184, please. <coughs> Um, so, do you see yourself in this picture? Yes. Can you um, circle yourself, please? And um, what are you doing at this point? Um, I'm recording. And is that a phone in your hand? Yes. Do you recognize anybody else in this photo? Yes. And can you circle who it is you recognize? And who's, 
Who's that by first name? Kaylin. And is that the friend Kaylin you were describing? Yes. So you had initially testified that you um, told her to stay in the car, that she stayed in the car. At some point, did she come out and join you? Yes. All right. And you, in this picture, have, did you did you recognize anybody else in this photo? Um, Darnella. And how do you know Darnella? Um, I used to go to school with her. Did you have any interaction with her um, while you were there? Um, before we walked up, I said something to her like, hi, how are you? Because I haven't seen her in a while. It was the summer, so. So you know who she is, but you didn't plan to meet her there or anything like that? No. Okay. Did you, um, while you were recording uh, with, with Kaylin's phone, were there uh, three separate video clips or three separate video uh, files that you created on that phone? Yes. And before today, did, did we have a chance to show you those videos? Yes. And did those three videos fairly and accurately show um, what you saw and what you recorded on, on Kaylin's phone? Yes. And we've marked those clips as exhibits 26, 27, and 28. Um, I'm going to offer those at this time, right, and we're not going to publish those, but well, I'm not going to publish them at this point. Let me receive them first. Oh, sorry, sorry. 26, 27, and 28 are received. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, there was also um, another video that you were shown. Um, did you have a chance to see a, a, a composite video or a side-by-side -side video of your three videos and a street camera all put together, synced up. Yes. And does that video that you saw, again, fairly and accurately show those three video clips and also show what you were doing and where you were positioned on that day? Yes. And we've marked that composite video as Exhibit 246. Um, I would offer that at this time. And no objection. 246 is received. Thank you, Your Honor. So we will publish that, and just before we do, um, Alyssa, we're going to play that video now, and I may stop it at points just to have you describe what's going on and what you're doing, okay? All right, so if we could publish Exhibit 246, please. Yes. Just one moment. All right, um, sorry about that, Alyssa. So we are going to play um, Exhibit 246, but before we start it up again, we have sort of the beginning still frame on this video, um, which is now at 8.19.24. If you could, um, do you see the car that you were driving 
where we have the video right now. Yes. And can you circle that on the screen, please? And does that show you um, in the driver's seat? Yes. And was that the moment that you arrived um, on May 25th? Was that this visual, in terms of the positioning of the officers, was that what you could see as you were pulling up? Yes. All right. Um, we can continue to play it. And we'll let the clip continue to play, but are you parking it as this is happening? Yes. And then when you see yourself come on screen, if you could point out where you are. And before we get to that point, um, and we can continue to play, did you initially start filming sort of from the side or behind the bus stop? Yes, I moved closer eventually. And why was it that you started filming, and we'll pause it right here, why was it that you started filming sort of at a distance? Um, I wasn't really sure what was happening at first. Um, I didn't want to get too close. And why did you not want to get too close at, at the beginning? Um, there was just a lot of police officers and it kind of was felt tense. So we're not going to start it up again just yet, but we're now at 8.20.17 and there's now a side-by-side -side video. Is that image on that right side of the screen um, the video that you've taken? Yes. And that's one of those clips, is that right? Yes. Okay, we'll let that play. What was going on right there as you were filming? Where were you positioned? Um, I was behind the bus stop or in front of it, I guess you could say. Okay. And was that your voice that came on briefly? Yes. Mm -hmm. And when you said what the expletive, um, what, what was going, what were you responding to? Um, I could hear George um, basically crying and begging them to get off of him, that he was in pain. And I knew that um, he was hurting, so it was upsetting. And at this point, we still don't see you on screen, is that right? Yes. So were you still in the area off screen by the bus stop? Yes. yourself on screen now? Yes. And can you circle where you are? And on the right side of the screen, is that the video that you're taking at that point in time? Yes. Okay. We can keep playing. get up. Uh, what do you want? I can't breathe. Please, the name of it. I can't breathe shit. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Bro, get up, get in the car, man. I you will. Just get up, get in the car. I can't move. I've been watching the whole thing, ah. man. Just get up, get in the car. Mama. Get up and get Mama. in the car right. I can't. I can't get y'all the opportunity to get in, bro. I My told knee. you, you can't win. My knee. You can't My win, knee. man. I'm through. I know you're here now, but you didn't listen. Uh -huh. That's the food. My stomach hurts. Uh -huh. My neck hurts. Uh -huh. Everything hurts. Ah, there's water or something. Bleed. Bleed. Ah, ah. I can't breathe, officer. Ah. Ah. Bro, that's me. so. They gonna kill me, man. Ah, ah. He isn't handcuffed. 
Bro, with your feet on his neck, man, you get off his neck. Yeah, that's that's raw right there with his feet on his neck. Damn, bro, you just seen your knee on his neck. Yeah, he got your feet right on his neck, officer. He ain't even resisting the rest. You having fun? I cannot breathe. You just a grown, you a oh, tough, oh, you a tough guy. Ah. You a tough guy, huh? I love y'all ass all short. tough guy. He not even resisting the rest, bro. Ah. Hey, bro, but why you just sitting there? He ain't doing nothing now. Put him in the car. Nah, he, he How long y'all got to hold him? Why don't you? It ain't about drugs, bro. Y'all understand that, but you don't got to have his hand in his neck, bro. Oh. He is human, bro. But I'm saying you can put him in the car. That's some bum ass shit. That's some bum ass shit, bro. That's some bum ass shit, bro. Y'all know what that is. You don't gotta sit there with your knee on his neck, bro. Bro, he ain't playing, bro. You you circling like in a jujitsu move, bro. You try you trapping his breathing right there, bro. Like you don't think that what it is, bro? You don't think nobody understands that shit right there, bro? I train at the academy, bro. That's some bullshit, bro. Right? That's bullshit, bro. That's bullshit, bro. You you fucking stopping his breathing right there, bro? Okay, he's talking. He's talking, bro. But you could get him off the ground. You been a bum right now. You could get him off the ground, bro. You could get him off the ground. You been a bum right now. He enjoying that. He enjoying Why, that shit. Him even more. He enjoying that shit. He a fucking bum, bro. He enjoying that shit right now, bro. You could have fucking put him in the car He's by now, bro. He's not now. resisting the rest Is of he nothing. talking now? You enjoying it. Look at you. Your body language is flames. Look you at fucking him. Bum. Bro, get the fuck off of him. What? No, I already know He's that, bro. Looking. I told you what happened to these bum ass dudes at what the, the academy, bro. You know. All right, we can pause there for a minute. Now, um, there's a voice saying things like, why are you needing him more? And he's not talking now. Look at him. He's about to knock out. Whose voice was that? That is mine. And when you say, when you were expressing, um, you know, why are you needing him more? What, what does that mean? What were you trying to get across? Um, well, at that point, I saw him, like, moving towards him more putting more pressure. And when you say him moving towards him, can you just, it was Derek. Mis so Derek, Mr. Chauvin was moving towards Mr. Floyd more? Yes, with his knee. Okay, so when you say kneeing him or are you meaning applying, pushing on him more with that knee? Yes. Okay, and you said, um, you know, he's not talking now, things like that. Did you notice a change in Mr. Floyd at that point in time? Uh, yes, he stopped being as vocal and he was more struggling to breathe. And when you said he's about to knock out, what does that mean? What were you trying to get across there? Um, well, I could see that he was going unconscious and his eyes were starting to roll to the back of his head and he had some saliva coming out of his mouth. Was that the point in time where you became even more concerned? Yes. Okay. All right, we'll continue to play. <laughs> and as this is playing, are you still standing there but not recording during this portion? Yeah. And then did you record? Again afterward? Yes. See, that's cool though, bro. You're a bum, bro. You're you're a bum for that. You're a bum for that, bro. You can't you get mad. You just sitting there stopping his breathing right now. Look at it! What the fuck? Right now, bro. Look at bro. Him. Get the fuck off of him! What is wrong with y'all? Like what the fuck? What the fuck? You're a fucking pussy. I hope you know you're a pussy on God. I hope your ass rot in hell. But look, well, you should check on him. He's not. No! Back off! He's not responsive right now. Get off the street. He's not responsive right now. Okay, then you would know. He's not responsive right now. He's not responsive right now, bro. Does he have a pulse? No, bro, look at him. He's not responsive check right check now, bro. Check bro, are you serious? Check. Let me see a pulse. 
Is he breathing right now? Check his pulse. How long have this conversation? Check his pulse. Okay. Check his pulse, Tao. Tao, right check, okay. check his pulse. Tao, check his pulse, bro. Bro, check his pulse, bro. You bogus, bro. You bogus. Don't do drugs, bro. What is that? What do you think that is? You saw you call what he doing okay? Get back up. You call what he doing okay? You call, you call what you doing? You call what he doing okay, bro? Are you really a firefighter? Yes, I am from Minneapolis. Bro, you get on the sidewalk. You call, you think that's okay? Check his pulse. Check his right now. check his pulse. Get back in the sidewalk. The man ain't moved yet, bro. The man ain't moved yet, bro. He's not moving. Bro, you're a bum, bro. You're a bum, bro. You're definitely a bum, bro. Check his pulse right now. Tell me what it is. Tell me what his pulse is right now. Check his pulse. Bro, he has not moved, not one time. In over a minute. Stop that. So, um, is it your voice um, asking about a badge number and saying he's not moving, things like that? Yes. Um, and then someone said he hasn't moved and then I and then in over a minute was that your voice too yes why was that important for you that in, in terms of saying over a minute were were you worried about the length of time that this was going on yes because I knew time was running out or that it had already what do you mean by time was running out that he was going to die I can keep going go ahead no, 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 no. Under, under, okay, that's cool. Go back to the store, bro. Go back in the store, bro. bro He's not bro, fucking I see, I see that. Bro, I'm, bro. I'm trying to help y'all out. Bro, you don't need to help me out, bro. I know your parents. I know everybody that owns the store. You don't need to help me the fuck out, bro. He's not fucking moving right now, bro. I just saw that, man. Bro, he was just moving when I walked up. Wow. So y'all are going to wait for the ambulance? Pop a pulse? I've been watching this the whole time. My business is trying to deal with you guys right now. Bro. He doesn't have a bro. There's three of you guys. You guys should be able to fucking multitask. That's your fucking bro. job, right? Bro, what is you, 1087, bro? You're a bum, bro. Or 987, bro? You're a bum. First thing you want to grab is your mace because you're scared, bro. You're scared of what fucking my He's still on the ground. He's still on it. Three minutes. Fuck off him. What are you doing? Three minutes. He's like, what? And somebody's saying you're still on him. Three minutes. Whose voice is that? Um, I believe that was a girl from inside the store. Okay. Um, did you hear your voice in that por portion in there? Uh, yes. And what were you saying? Um, I don't exactly remember exactly what I said, but okay. I heard my voice. Were you upset in that moment? Yes. And again, was your concern increasing over time? Yes. Um, at that point, I kind of knew you kind of knew what? That he was dead or not breathing. And what made you think that he was dead or not breathing at that point? Um, his eyes were closed and he was just laying there. No longer fighting or resisting. And again, when you were saying fighting and resisting before, what do you mean by that? Were you talking about breathing or are you talking about a fight? Breathing. Okay. Can go ahead and play it. Like no, for real? Bro, you're still man. on him, bro. Bro, what? Yes. Bro, what the fuck you is you doing? Like, what the fuck is doing? Don't, 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 did you notice anything in particular when uh, the ambulance came uh, about Mr. Floyd, um, what he looked to you at that point? Um, he didn't look alive. I noticed that the paramedics um, looked at his eyes, checked his pulse, and kind of just proceeded to put him on the gurney. He didn't really say anything. Um, and... Um, would you, had you previously described his body as limp? Yeah. Okay. All right, you can play the rest. Thank you. Co-workers, right? Those are your partners, right? Like, what? Y'all know that's not, like... This is what it is, bro. This is what it is. We got to deal with this show. They're not going to help us, bro. They're not going to help us. 
Like, what the fuck? He's not doing nothing to y'all. I'm a first person. 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 Don't touch, don't touch me. Don't touch me. Do not touch me. He didn't touch me. Hey, baby. 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 Hey, I can't help him, I can't push 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 him, I think you had said you had said that earlier too. Why was that important for you? You know, badge numbers, stuff like that. Um, I just at that point I kind of felt like all I could do was catch what was going on with the camera, and I just wanted to make sure I got everyone there. That's why I was moving around a lot. Did you feel it was important for you to document what was going on? Yes. Um, how did watching all this in the moment uh, feel for you? Um, it felt really like like a lot to take in at first. Um, I almost walked away at first because it was a lot to watch, but I knew that it was wrong and I couldn't just walk away even though I couldn't do anything about it. And since that time, since you saw this happen last year, what what impact has it had on you since then? Um, well, it didn't really affect me right away because I kind of just felt emotionally numb about it. I didn't run to the internet or anything. I kind of just kept to myself and tried to go on with my day and remember what I really came there for. Um, and after the fact, um, after you had some time to process it, what did, what did you feel? Um, I felt really like, like I said, numb to the whole situation. I didn't, I kind of just pushed it aside because I didn't really know how to feel. It was a lot to take in. Did you um, go back to Cup Foods after, after that? I still haven't been there to this day. And why is that? I don't want to be reminded. Nothing further your own. Mr. Nelson. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hello. Just a few questions for you. Do you recall um, being interviewed by Agent Peterson and Ryerson of the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension? I believe so. Okay. You remember talking to two police officers about what you observed, what you saw, things of that nature? Yes. And if I told you their names were Agents Ryerson and Peterson, would you have any reason to dispute me? Uh, no. Okay. Um, and they recorded that call, is that correct? Yes. And then again, um, I believe just within the last two or three days, you met with the prosecution team? Yes. And um, you told them, gave them some more information as well, correct? Yes. All right. So do you recall telling Agent Peterson and Ryerson, as well as the prosecution team, that while you were there, you observed the officers check Mr. Floyd's radio pulse? 
Um, I said I believed that they did. Um, the two that were on his body, I thought at one point that I did see someone try. Um, nothing changed, though. Nothing of their body language or anything changed. Okay. Um, do you recall, were you given an opportunity to listen to your previous statement? No. Were you ever given a transcript of your previous statement? No. Would you disagree with me if I told you you said, I even saw them check his pulse multiple times before the ambulance got there? I would not agree with that. You would not agree with that? Yeah, because I don't remember. You don't remember that now? Can you restate it? Sure. Back when you were interviewed by the police officers in September, you told them that you saw the officers check his pulse multiple times before the ambulance got there. I do not believe I said multiple times. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. Date stamp 36415, page 408. I'm going to hand you this through this plexiglass, and there's some, I'm just going to point to the last underline. I'm going to ask you to read that in your mind. So did, did you tell Agents Ryerson and Peterson that you saw the officers check for a pulse multiple times? Yes, I did, and then afterwards I told them that they it looked like they did not find one. Okay. Now, you also um, described to the officers that you were angry. Yes. And you would agree to this day that you were angry at what you saw. Yes. And would you describe others in the crowd as angry as well? I would assume so. I have no further questions. Any regrets? Alyssa, you um, were just asked some questions about a pulse. Um, did that refresh your recollection about that portion of what you saw? Um, a little bit. Um, the day those officers came to my house, it was multiple times of being bothered. And um, it was kind of like they kind of forced the interview onto me, so. Okay. So thinking about it today, in terms of what you saw that day, um, what did, just tell the jury what you saw in terms of somebody checking a pulse. Um, well, I don't exactly remember standing right there all the way because it's kind of like in and out. Um, but re-watching the video, I remember seeing like someone move their hands towards his, uh, his wrists, his vitals behind his back. And was that person uh, Mr. Chauvin? No. So that was someone else? Yes. And are you unclear about whether or not that was an actual pulse check because you said they didn't change anything they were doing. Correct. Okay. And would, did you assume that if they hadn't, that, that if they were concerned, they would have changed what they were doing? Yes. Would they have gotten up off him? Is that what you expected to happen? Yes, that is what I would expect they would do. And you were asked some questions about being angry. Um, were you upset about what was going on in front of you? Yes. Did you um, attack anybody? No. Hit anybody? No. Um, you know, threaten the officers in any way? No. So when you say angry, uh, what do you mean? Um, I was upset because there was nothing that we could do as bystanders except watch them take this man's life in front of our eyes. And when you say we, were all of you doing what you were doing, meaning not getting physical and not throwing punches or making threats to the officers. Correct. 
correct. Nothing passed. Nothing passed. All right, thank you. You may step down. And next witness. Members of the jury, why don't we have you go back to the other, uh, long enough for a bathroom break, how's that?
Next witness will also be off video. swear you in. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury? But the testimony you're about to give will be the truth. Yes. Okay. Uh, we like it probably because it's easier to hear you. If you wouldn't mind taking your mask off. Yes. That'd be great. There's also sanitizer and Kleenex there if you need it. Uh, we're going to go off audio. Ms. Eldridge. Good afternoon, Kaylin. Hello. How are you feeling today? A little nervous. A lot of anxiety. Tell me why you have anxiety today. Um, just because of what happened. Just want the truth to come out. Okay. Deep breaths. We'll take it slow, okay? If you need a break, you just let me know. Okay. All right? Okay. You ready? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to start with some easy questions, background questions, okay? So why don't you tell the jury how old you are? I'm 17 years old. And are you uh, a high school student now? Yes, I'm a senior. And um, are you doing in-person school or online? Online school. How's that going? It's going good. Almost there? For your yeah, senior year. almost there. Um, and, and what city do you live in now? St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, was there a time that you and your family lived in Minneapolis, South Minneapolis? Yes, when I was younger. Okay. Do you still have some friends, family friends in that area? Yes. And Can I ask you one favor? Can you just pause a little bit and answer the question? We have a court reporter who's taking everything down with a stenographic machine, and it'll make it a little easier for her to take everything down. So. Don't worry about it, you're doing fine. And I talk fast, I'll try to slow it down, try to make it easy for everybody. Um, okay, so you said you still have friends in South Minneapolis. Yes. And um, is one of those friends named Alyssa? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you some questions um, about you know, the reason you're here today. So, I want to tell the jury why you're here today. For George Floyd. Okay. And when you say for George Floyd, did you see what happened to George Floyd? Yes. Um, so, I'm going to ask you some questions about that, okay? Okay. You ready? Yes. If you need a tissue, you need a break, you just put up your hand and let me know, okay? Okay. But you can grab tissue anytime you need one. So, um, I'm going to ask you some questions about that day, um, the day that all this happened. So, first things first, how, how did you come to be in the area? What were, what were you doing that day? Me and Alyssa were going to get snacks and an aux cord for the radio. And um, where, where were you headed that day? Where did you want to go? To go. Cook. And when you say cup, is that cup foods? Yes. All right. So you said you were with Alyssa. Um, and how did you guys get there? Uh, we drove there. And who drove, you or Alyssa? Alyssa. And um, where were you in the car? Were you in the front passenger seat? Yes. Is it just the two of you together? Yes. So, um, she was driving, you're in the passenger seat, you're headed to Cup Foods. What's the first thing you notice once you get into the area? Um, we hear George, George Floyd's voice uh, yelling out for his mom and saying he can't breathe. 
Okay. And f did you notice, um, well, how soon did you notice what was going on? Were you still driving up when you noticed what was going on? Uh, yes. And is that what you heard from the car? Yes. And uh, what did you see as you were driving up? We seen three officers on top of George Floyd. And what did you do next? Did you park, did Alyssa park the car? Yes. And then what happened? Uh, she pulled over and she asked if she should record it and she didn't have a phone at the time. So she took my phone and recorded it. And what were you doing when uh, did she get out of the car first? Yes, she told me to stay in the car and leave the car just in case anything happened. We didn't know what was going on. So did you stay in the car for a, some period of time? Yes. So when you were in the car and Alyssa got out of the car, um, could you hear what was going on? Yes, I could kind of hear what was going on. All right. I don't specifically remember exactly what was said but I do remember hearing voices. So tell the jury just what you remember noticing from where you were in the car. What what were you hearing or seeing or observing? I believe I heard George Floyd um, yelling still, uh, saying he can't breathe. And then I heard witnesses that were there uh, saying he was unresponsive. And that's uh, when I started hearing voices getting louder, I got out of the car. Okay, so I'm gonna stop you there for just a second. Um, you talked about George Floyd. Uh, you said you're here for George Floyd and you're talking about seeing George Floyd. Did you know who he was at that time? No. After the fact, um, did you learn his yes. name? Yes. Okay, so you now know him to be George Floyd. Yes. When you heard, um, you said you heard voices getting louder. Um, what prompted you to get out of the car? What made you think you should get out of the car? I guess it was kind of just a gut feeling. When you said you heard voices getting louder, was there something about the tone or what was said that- It sounded serious. Okay, and what made you think it was something serious? Just the way like everyone sounded. So what did you do? I got out of the car and I walked up and that's when I saw George Floyd unconscious and Derek on his neck. Okay, so I'm gonna break that down a little bit. You said you saw George Floyd unconscious. What made you think that George Floyd was unconscious when you saw him? He wasn't talking anymore. And when we pulled up, he was talking. His eyes were closed. He wasn't moving. And you said you saw Derek on top of him? Yes. And by Derek, do you mean Derek Chauvin? Yes. Did you know who that was at the time? No. But did you learn his name later? Yes. Um, so when you said that you saw Derek or Mr. Chauvin on top of George Floyd, what was, what did you see Mr. Chauvin doing? Uh, I saw him kind of digging his knee into his neck more. Like he was putting a lot of pressure on his neck that wasn't needed. And how could you tell, or what made you think from your point of view that Mr. Chauvin was putting more pressure on, on George Floyd's neck? Um, you could see it, like his foot movement. So when you say, digging, um, are you talking about the position of Mr. Chauvin's knee on Mr. Floyd's neck? Yes. Okay. Um, so you come out to see Mr. Floyd who looks unconscious to you. What else do you see and hear going on around you? The witnesses telling him to check for a pulse. And um, what happened at that point? Mm. Did you did you see anybody 
check for a pulse or do anything at that point? No, way? not that I saw. Okay. Um, did you see Mr. Chauvin or anybody else move or change or get up off Mr. Floyd? No. Um, did you, um, were you concerned at that point in time? Yes. Were you saying anything once you got um, into that uh, group of people? Yes, I asked, why are you guys still on top of him? He's not doing anything wrong. He was handcuffed. And after you said that, um, was there any response from the, any of the officers? Did any of them move? Did Mr. Chauvin move? No. Did any of them address your concerns? No. They're really hostile. And when you say hostile, um, tell the jury what you mean by that. Like, Who? It t the tone in their voice was really, well, the officer Tao's voice was really angry. So was Officer Tao um, interacting with the people yes. on the street at that point? I'm sorry, is that a yes? Yes. Okay. So you just have to wait until I'm done asking before you answer. Sorry. That's okay, I, I do it too. Um, okay, so Officer Tao appeared hostile. Can you just describe um, what he was doing that made you feel that way? I, he pushed one of the witnesses there uh, onto the sidewalk. And did you know that person? No. Did you see anybody being, um, any of the, you said witnesses, but any of those bystanders, any of those people on the curb with you, were any of those people being violent or aggressive in any way? No. Um, but you saw Mr. They were just using their voice. Okay. So you heard people using their voices, but saw Mr. Uh, Officer Tao being hostile. Yes. Um, what else did you see? Did you see any of the other officers who were there at that, when you were on the curb? Not when I was on the curb. And what about Mr. Chauvin? Did you see him? Yes. And what did you, um, how would you describe his body movement or body language at that point? Kind of angry, like. So I'm gonna stop you there, but tell me what he was doing with his body. He was like digging his knee into George Floyd's neck. Did you notice anything else about um, him, Mr. Chauvin? Um, reaching for anything or touching his mace or anything like yes, that? Yes, he did grab his mace and started shaking it at us. And how did you feel at that point? Scared. And why did you feel scared then? Because I didn't know what was going to happen. And were you scared of Mr. Chauvin or scared of Mr. Floyd or something else? I was scared of Chauvin. Okay. Um, that point that you saw uh, Mr. Chauvin go for his mace, was there anybody in your group of witnesses or bystanders that were, um, again, being violent or, or a attacking in any way? No. Okay. I'm going to put up Exhibit 184, please. And you should see that on your screen in front of you. Um, do you see yourself in this picture? Yes. Can you um, just circle yourself on that screen? It's a touch screen. Use your finger. And do you see anyone else you recognize there? No, Lisa. And, um, you, you circled Alyssa a second. Uh, what is Alyssa doing there? She's recording. And is that your cell phone she has? Yes. Um, and what were you doing at this point? I was telling uh, Donald Williams, I believe his name is. Uh, I was like, because the cop, I think, pushed him. I don't exactly remember. But uh, I told them, like, don't 
Like, because I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't want anybody, like, fighting the cops or anything like that. Okay. Because I didn't know it would escalate. Did you know Donald Williams at that time? No. Did you learn his name uh, somehow after the fact? Yes. Was there anybody fighting with the cops? No. Was there any fight that happened with any of those bystanders with no. the cops? Were you concerned for everybody's safety? Yes. Okay. Um, and at some point, did you see, um, we can take that down, did you see an ambulance arrive? Yes. And um, what was going on at that point in time? Uh, the ambulance pulled up and Derek was still on his neck. The ambulance people had to tell him, signal him to get up. And you just made a motion with your hands. When you say signal him to get up, um, did you see a paramedic make a motion to Mr. Chauvin that looked to you like a get up kind of motion? Yes. Okay. Um, after the paramedics arrived, was that the first time that you saw Mr. Chauvin get up off Mr. Floyd? Yes. Um, and how did Mr. Floyd look to you? What did his condition appear to be to you? He looked kind of like purple, like he wasn't getting enough circulation. And was he uh, moving or talking or anything at that point? He was really limp. Okay. And. I know this is tough to talk about, and I know it's hard, so take your time, but what did, what did you think at that moment? Well, I didn't know for sure if George Floyd was dead until after the fact, but I had a gut feeling. So, based on what you saw and how his body looked to you when they took him away, did he look dead to you at that point? Yes. And did you see anybody until the paramedics arrived, any of the officers attempt to render first aid or CPR or give any medical help before that? No. Okay. Nothing further, Your Honor. Sure. All right, thank you. You may step down. Take another break. And then we'll go in after. Thank you.
And then, Your Honor, we would publish to the jury Exhibit 25. Exhibit 25, A, 25, 2000, 911, what is the address of the emergency? Hello. I am on the block of 38th in Chicago, and I literally watched police officers not take a pulse and not do anything to save a man. And I am a first responder myself. And I literally have it on video camera. <clears throat> I just happen to be on a walk. So this dude, this they fucking killed him. So I, uh, do you want to speak to I, the I'm recording this. I'm, I mean, I'm fucking recording this right now. I'm willing to talk for ages about this. So if you need to talk to a supervisor right now or if somebody needs to get into contact with me later on. Let me get you over to the supervisor, okay? Hang on one second. Twenty thirty three, twenty eight, May, twenty five, two thousand, twenty. Thank you, Arthur. We would call Genevieve Hansen to the stand. And I think to be able to hear you more clearly, if you are comfortable in doing so, I'd ask that you remove your mask. Okay. And let's begin by uh, you giving your full name, spelling each of your names, please. Um, my name is Genevieve Hansen, G-E-N-E-V-I-E-V-E, -E -E -E, last name Hansen, H-A-N-S-E-N. Thank you. Mr. Pratt. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Hansen, um, what's your current occupation? What do you do? I'm a firefighter for Minneapolis. That City. explains the uniform you're wearing today? Correct, sir. And uh, how long have you been a firefighter for the city of Minneapolis? Just about two years now. And so, not a question I often like to ask women, but how old are you? 27. Okay. There's a reason we ask that. <laughs> the jury will figure that out later. Okay. So, for about two years now, you've been a firefighter. And can you describe for the jurors you know, what you had to do uh, to become a firefighter for the city of Minneapolis? Um, I, there's a hiring process, um, and once you're hired, uh, 
we go through an EMT training. Um, I am uh, certified for the state and a national license. Um, and then you go forward with a uh, firefighter licenses. Um, that's a four month academy. And so tell us, um, well, even before starting as a firefighter, did you have to learn some first aid type? Yeah, um, it wasn't necessary to get on the job, but I had gone through an EMT program already. So I've gone through the course twice. So when did you first do the EMT program? Um, I think it was sometime in 2017. And so what was that program? How long was that? Um, it's called Pathways Academy. Uh, and it was a summer. Um, it was just the majority of the summer. I went to a fire station and did my course. And so that, do you remember how long that was? Was that four months, did you say? Uh, maybe about that. It wasn't every day, so it depends on which one, which one you do. And so what kinds of things did you do during your work at Pathways Academy? Um, we did a lot. The Pathways Academy is longer than your typical um, EMT training uh, because it really wants to give a chance to um, people to pass it. It's quite a difficult test. Um, so we did a lot of hands-on training and uh, book work. And so the book work, or what kinds of books, what are you learning in, in that? Um, probably more than you need to know about the anatomy and different bones and the way your heart works and then down to basic um, life-saving things that we need to know for, for my job or um, if you wanted to move forward with paramedics, um, I could go on. <laughs> so you have some classroom? Correct. And do you remember how long the classroom instruction was? A day. Okay. Um, I think it was like an eight hour day or something. And then you have some more hands-on training? That was throughout the day. It would be kind of, and we had homework, I mean we had homework all night, every night for the whole time. So how long was the Pathways Academy program altogether? I think it was probably about three months or so. I can I can check. But. So then after the, um, you have a day of classroom, what do you spend the rest of the time doing? Studying. What's that? Studying. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and so for then, um, there's some... We did quite a few ride-alongs as well with, uh, okay. I did a couple of ride-alongs with paramedics and with fire. So is this Pathways Academy affiliated with the fire department? Um, it's, I think, it, I believe it's through the city of Minneapolis, um, just for um, trying to uh, reach out to city youth, youth within the city. So is this a way of helping you get a job as a firefighter? Yes. Okay. And um, so then during that time, you're doing some ride-alongs, you're actually working with the fire department? Mm -hmm. I actually had a cardiac arrest our first call on my first ride along. It's quite the sight. And that was before you were even hired as a firefighter? Before I was hired as a firefighter, before I was an EMT. Um, and so then after Pathways Academy, did you have to take a, a test of some kind? Yes, I got, that's when I got my national registry okay. test finished. And you know, what, describe for you Excuse me. If you would describe for the jury what that test is like, how, how long is it? Yeah, um, you go through a, a hands-on portion and a written portion, um, just to demonstrate that you're prepared for any life safety, uh, life-saving measures you need to take, or splinting, or you know, kind of covers all of that, and then the test is really scenario based um, like what um, what do, are the first things you need to look at what are the most important things um, that you need to address to have the best outcome for the patient so is it uh, written or is it uh, oh both okay. both, both. Oh, uh, you mean the written part or the it's fill in the blank and then <laughs> right so yeah it's um, some 
like written part, but is there also like showing you know how to do certain procedures? Right, that's what I was explaining before in the hands-on portion. Right, hands-on, thank you. Mm -hmm. So that when you say both, it's a written test kind of and as well as hands-on. Separate days, yep. Okay. And um, so you took that test at the end of the Pathway Academies, Pathways mm -hmm. Academy program? Yep, and, and at the end of, or in the, in the middle of my academy for the fire department. And so, did you pass? Yes. And so then you obtain a certification? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes, sir. And what is the uh, certification for? What does that mean you are? Um, I, I can, there's a range of things that I can do um, for, I, our role a lot of times is to assist the medics or we get there before the medics and so we can, um, you know, start any basic um, wound bandaging or up to, you know, starting compressions for full C working CPR right away. Does it also involve assessing a patient to determine what is needed? Correct. That's the first thing we would do. Okay. And then, so you had certified as an EMT, and I guess just for the record, what does EMT stand for? Emergency Medical Technician. And you got a national certification for that? Yep, and a state. And is that separate testing, or how does that work to get national and state? Um, I, yeah, I believe it is separate testing, and you have um, we have continuous hours of education that for for both. And so, um, since your certification, you've had to continue taking classes to maintain mm -hmm. the certification. Yep, the fire department does continuing education all year round. So then, you, uh, when you finished Pathways Academy, uh, had you already been hired by the fire department, or did that come after? That came after about like I think it about a year after I started the process. And then, as uh, or once you got hired, was that when you obtained the state certification? Then, um, I think I had both all along. Some uh, the Pathways is why I have both. So as part of uh, this certification, um, you are able to uh, do what we think of as CPR. Right. And that's, well, explain for the jurors what CPR is when we use that term. Um, so uh, if we find no pulse, um, we would, I would ask for um, medical, you know, calling 911. I'd want an AED on scene and I would start compressions. If I had had my med bag, I would also be um, giving breaths. Um, but if I didn't, I'm just a rate of 100 compressions a minute. And so CPR is uh, the process of trying to resuscitate somebody if I'm... To yeah, we're, we're looking for to regain a, a heart rhythm. And heart rhythm is another way of saying the pulse, essentially. Correct. Okay. You can tell I have not been through the, <laughs> the training you have, right? <laughs> um, and so I just want to make sure you know that I mean, you know more about this than we do. So that's why I'm trying to just fill in these terms. Yeah. Okay. And um, you know, incidentally, before Pathways Academy, had you received some training in like CPR before that even? Yeah, I did um, Red Cross babysitting. Work as a lifeguard ever? Yes, I was a lifeguard. Okay. Yeah. So you got to know that kind of stuff then, too. Yeah, yep. And that was I, I, I did that quite a few times in my youth. Can you wait until you're done with the questions so that we don't have people talking over each other? I'm sorry, say it again? Uh, let's make sure we don't talk over each other. Oh, sorry, I didn't know. It that. makes it really hard to have a good record. So. Got it. All right. Thank you. Yeah, the court reporter has to take down everything we're saying, so we got to each wait to, to answer, yeah. or wait for the question to be done. Um, I'll try to be better about that too. So um, so when you start working for the fire department, um, you know, explain if you would for the jury, when you go in for your shift, you know, what's, who else, who are your coworkers, not, you know, who they are, but like how many people are at a fire station during a shift and how are they divided up? Yeah, um, it depends on if you're at a single house or a double house, meaning is there just an engine there or is there an engine and a ladder? Um, 
uh, and on the engine we have three to four, and on the truck we ride four. Um, so maybe eight in the house, and uh, if there's a chief fare or not, we're all EMTs. And so, as a firefighter, you, you mentioned earlier, I think, receiving separate training on fighting fires, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that makes sense, mm -hmm. right? Very different jobs. Yeah. And um, so in your two years uh, as a firefighter, have you gone to fires? Yeah, quite, quite a few for um, somebody with as much time on it as I have. And have you... You know, had to enter buildings that are on fire. Yes, sir. And um, provide, well, I guess, rescue for people who are in a building that's on fire. Yes, I have pulled victims out of buildings. And when you do that as a, a unit of you know, four or however many other firefighters are there, you all work together on those types of calls. Correct. When you're, um, well, in your work as a firefighter, you know, the, the title obviously makes us all think that you fight fires. Mm -hmm. But you do a lot more than that, correct? Mm -hmm. You have to say yes or no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, the thing to remember is the court reporter has to take it all down. So oh, right. Sorry. We uh, yes, we, we're, we don't often get a fire. Um, I would say, I mean, I've heard quite a few people give um, like a 90% medical for the calls, and that also depends on which station and which part of the city you're serving. So, you know, whatever the specific number is, it's the great majority of your cases are medical, oh, yeah. not fire. Right. And um, in those uh, medical calls that you've been on since you started working as a firefighter in Minneapolis, have there been times when you have had to provide resuscitation to someone who was pulseless? Many times. Have there been times when you have been on a call and you have had to assess a patient's condition and what they might need? Many times. Um, majority of the time uh, we arrive before the paramedics just based on um, how many fire stations are in the city and that's that's why we respond to medical calls so we can assist them and or be there if they can't be immediately. So incidentally you've talked about you know working at the fire station your shift is it a regular nine to five job how are your shifts done? Um, my personally my shifts are 48 hours um, so I'm um, there's also the option of working 24 hours at a time um, but I'm at the fire station for 48 hours and calls in the middle of the night. And then even. you get a weekend or something? Or how? I have four days off then after that. Mm -hmm. So when you're, uh, in your experience, mm -hmm. um, how many like times per shift would you say you have a medical call involving an unconscious or, or pulseless person? Um, it really depends on which station you're, you're at. Um, I'm at a particularly busy station, um, so it could be anywhere from, you know, for, for pulseless, um, I'm, in a, I'm in an area where there's a lot of um, overdosing, um, so anywhere from one to five times in a sh in a 24 hour period so dealing with a person who is it does not have a pulse is fairly common yeah correct i want to draw your attention to may 25th of 2020 um, so at that point you had been working as a firefighter for a little over a year mm -hmm. is that yes yes sir and um, were you in the area of uh, Cup Foods at 38th and Chicago. Yes, sir. And were you working that day? No. And, um, you know, without telling us where you live, um, do you live in that area? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm, I'm in walking distance of that area. Okay. And so 
on that date uh, in the early evening, um, you know, um, just what were y'all doing that you found yourself in that area? Um, I was just going for a walk. Um, I, I believe I worked the day before. Um, so a lot of times you're just kind of tired and I just wanted to sort of have a peaceful day. Um, so I went on a walk and I sat in a little community garden on uh, 38th for a while. Um, and just uh, thought it would be getting kind of dark soon. So I decided to take Chicago home rather than go through neighborhood streets. Do you remember, were you on foot or in your car? I was on foot. And uh, so you approached Cup Foods on Chicago? Um, yes, okay. sir. And I'm, well, as you were approaching that area, did something catch your attention? Mm -hmm. um, it's not uncommon to see, you know, lights and think that, oh, my coworkers are there. Um, so from a distance, I figured, you know, it could have could have been anything, um, but I figured that a fire was there, so I started walking in that direction, and as I got closer, there was a woman um, uh, across the street um, screaming that they were killing him, so that's when I was alerted that the situation wasn't a basic medical call. So at some point, did you walk to the area where this woman was? Yes, I actually asked her what was going on. And then from there, did you did you notice some police cars in the area? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, sir. And um, did you then walk over to that area where the police cars were? I walked. The police car. Yeah, I walked kind of in a in a big circle around the scene just to sort of start to have an idea what was what was actually going on. And. Um, so you approached this uh, police car where the incident was taking place? Uh, yeah, I came from behind um, the, the officers. And um, I'm going to show you exhibit one on the screen. Okay. It should come up on the screen right in front of you. Okay. Yes, Your Honor, this has been admitted already. Do you see the... Uh, Photograph of Exhibit One in front of you. Yes. And you recognize this as the intersection of 38th and Chicago. Yes. And you'll notice in front of you there should be a little stylus like this. Okay. And you can actually draw on the screen with that. Okay. And I'd ask you just to kind of draw on there for the jury. You know your approach to this area and where you went until you went over by the squad car. Okay. Um, so the garden was on this side of the street. Um, I'm not sure if I walked across or straight, but the woman that um, I first um, asked what was going on was just about here. Um, so I made my way around and I, I believe I came all the way around this way, and I was kind of watching what was going on here, and then I made my way around. And then just for the benefit of the record, you're drawing uh, that you were going westbound on 38th, and then crossed over to the Dragon Walk side of 38th. That's where you crossed Chicago, then crossed 38th to near the Speedway store, and from there crossed over to the Cup Food side of Chicago. Yes, sir. All right. And Your Honor, can you erase that all in one fell swoop? Um, and then, so when you crossed from the Speedway side of the store, um, well, let me do it this way. No, no, I'll back up. Why did you bother to walk then from the Speedway side of the store? over to the cup food side of the store? Um, because I was concerned um, to see a, a handcuffed man who was not moving um, with officers 
with their whole body weight on his back um, and a crowd that was stressed out. And so we have, um, thanks. we have previously admitted Exhibit 11. And this is a uh, video taken from a camera across the street. And I'm going to show you a shortened version of Exhibit 11. Mm -hmm. All right? Is that yes? Yes. All right. And for the record, we are starting this at um, 8.25, 20 approximately. So do you see that video on the screen? Yes. All right. And does this look like, you know, the area that we were talking about where you went and approached this yes. scene that you described? All right. Now, I'm going to pause it right here. Yes. And looking at this, do you see this person I'm circling here? That's myself. Okay. And if um, everybody was seeing you approach from down here, correct? You came this way. Is that right? Correct, yeah. All right, so you came from the bottom of the screen to this area, and um, you seem to be holding something in your hand. Do you recall what you were holding? Um, I didn't have anything but my phone, I believe, or my keys. And um, so what I'd like to do is let this run um, to show where you were during this incident, all right? So just keeping an eye on where you are okay. um, and how you remain at the scene, all right? Okay. Okay. Now, if we can pause it right here, and just for the record, it's at 8.26.29. We saw the camera moved a little bit, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so for a moment there, you were just off screen, correct? Correct. And up until that point, you had essentially remained on the sidewalk, correct? Correct. And so at that point, you stepped off the curb. Did you, how far from the curb did you go while you were off the screen? I don't remember. Okay. You didn't leave the area? No. And at that moment, you go back up onto the sidewalk. Do you remember why you went back up onto the sidewalk? Um, because the officer controlling the scene was requesting that we stay on the sidewalk, demanding yeah. we stay on the sidewalk. And um, if you could just take the stylus and circle the officer that you're saying demanded you stay on the sidewalk. And for the record, Your Honor, the, the witness is uh, drawing a circle around Officer Tao. And uh, so when he uh, asked you to go back up on the sidewalk, you did? Yes, sir. And at some point, you started a video recording with your phone, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, so we've already dealt with that, but at some point here, you actually start recording, correct? Correct. All right.
And Ms. Hansen, did you, well, I'm sorry, I'm gonna hold off on another question for now. I'm going to ask that the video be paused here at, for the record at 8 30 25 26 to be more precise um, the video has shown that the ambulance has left with mr floyd and you're still standing there on the sidewalk correct correct so during that time period after you first arrived went up on the sidewalk there was just that one time that you left the sidewalk and went out into the street correct correct all right When you first walked up and you told the jury about coming around and crossing uh, Chicago and approaching, when you first walked up, did you observe the officers that were uh, on top of the individual on the ground? Yes. Did you know any of those officers or recognize any of them? Uh, once I was all the way around, I um, recognized their um, Chauvin's face. Okay. And where did you recognize it from? Uh, it was a call probably the day before, or I, th I believe it was the, the shift I had just worked. Um, but did you know him at all? No, sir. Did you talk to him on that previous call? Or? No, sir. I just noticed him because I was had observed him on that previous call. Do you know his name at that point in time? No, sir. All right. So what did you see about the officers there in relation to the body on the ground? Um, I noticed uh, leaning, uh, their, the officers were leaning over his body and with 
the, it must have it ap appeared to have be the majority of their weight on m Mr. Floyd. And so, how many officers did you see over Mr. Floyd? Um, in my memory, for whatever reason, I remember seeing four on his body, and we know now that that was three. So when you first walked up, you came around from that side, but then you had to go around to the other side on the curb, other side of the squad car, correct? Correct. All right. And um, when you saw that positioning of those officers, um, did that concern you? Absolutely. Why? Um, he wasn't moving and he was cuffed and that's a, a three grown men is a lot of putting all their weight on somebody is too much. And did you notice where uh, this officer you now know to be Mr. Chauvin, uh, where he was putting his weight on Mr. Floyd? His neck. And incidentally, did you know the person laying on the ground, prone on the ground, who was handcuffed? Not, no, sir. You subsequently learned his identity? Correct. Right. And that individual on the ground under the officers, um, could you tell if he was moving at all? Um, I, I, he was not moving. His face was, uh, the first thing that concerned me is his face was like, smashed smushed into the ground, swollen appearing, swollen to me. And, um, you know, at that point, are you acting a little bit as Genevieve Hansen EMT? Um, I identified myself right away because I, I noticed that he needed medical attention. Um, I, it didn't take me long to realize that he was, had an altered level of consciousness and in our training that is when the first sign that somebody needs medical attention. So my attention moved from Mr. Floyd to how can I gain access to this patient and give him medical attention or direct the officers. And I didn't pay much attention to George Floyd after that. So when you first got there and you saw Mr. Floyd on the ground, um, you mentioned about seeing his face. Correct? Correct. And incidentally, I think in a subsequent interview, you had talked about Mr. Floyd's face facing towards the speedway, correct? Correct. And you, Which is just what my memory did, but we know that's not right. And now, now as you sit here today, do you remember seeing his face when you were around to the squad car side of him? Yes, sir. All right. And so in terms of you know, his face when you're first there, or, or even the rest of him, what is it that you saw that made you concerned about his medical needs? Um, I was really concerned about, I thought his face looked puffy and swollen, um, which would happen if you were putting a grown man's weight on someone's neck. Um, I, I noticed some fluid coming from what looked like George Floyd's body. Um, and in a lot of cases, we see a patient uh, release their bladder um, when they die. Um, I can't tell you exactly where the fluid was coming from, but that's where my mind went. Um, he wasn't moving. Um, he was being restrained, but he wasn't moving. When you first arrived, was he vocalizing at all? Was he speaking at all? I don't remember. And um, earlier you used the term altered consciousness. Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes. And what do you mean by that? What did you see in terms of his consciousness? Um, well, we, um, when we're assessing on a, a level of consciousness on a call, we'll often first try to just um, talk to the patient and see if they respond. And if we don't get a response, we'll often kind of tap them on the shoulder or um, apply sort of painful stimuli uh, and 
often I would do a sternal rub or, you know, press their fingernail very hard. And if they respond to that, we know that, you know, we can assess their level of consciousness based on that. Um, when somebody's on, uh, laying on your, or, you know, leaning into your neck, um, that's painful stimuli. So, so I could tell that from the sidebar. Tell what? That he had an altered level of consciousness to the point that he wasn't responding to painful stimuli. You mentioned um, that Mr. Chauvin had a knee on Mr. Floyd's neck. Correct. Did you see where his other leg was? Um, I don't remember anymore, but I think I... I, th I may have said something about it in previous. Um, Did you think it was on Mr. Floyd's back? I don't know. Okay. And in that moment, uh, when you first arrived and, and observed what you could about Mr. Floyd, what did you think you needed to do? I think I, I had already assessed that he had an altered level of consciousness. What I needed to know is whether or not he had a pulse anymore. And, you know, I may back you up just a little bit here, but did you try and assess, you know, how much weight Mr. Chauvin was putting on George Floyd? Um, I, I, I mean, I didn't try to. I recognized that it was an issue right away because he he seemed very comfortable you um, with who is he show officer Chauvin okay. um, seemed very comfortable with m the majority of his weight balanced on top of mr. Floyd's neck um, in my memory he had his hand in his pocket he looked so comfortable and um, if his hand wasn't actually in his pocket would that change anything that you Obsessed at the time? Um, I suppose not. He he was comfortable in the position that he was in. So if his hand, instead of being in his pocket, was simply resting on his thigh, would that change any of your no. assessment? He wasn't distributing the weight and on the car, on the the pavement. When you first approached, you said you identified yourself as a firefighter. Correct. To whom did you identify yourself? To Officer Tao, controlling the scene. I, I spoke loudly enough that I, I would think that the, the other three officers would have been able to hear me throughout the event. We know you weren't, well, let me ask you this way. How did Officer Tao respond? Um, he said something along the lines of, if you really are a Minneapolis um, firefighter, you would know better than to get involved. What did you think of that? First, I was worried that he wasn't um, going to believe me um, and not let me um, help. And I also, that's, that's not right. I mean, that's exactly what I should have done. There was no medical assistance on scene and I I, be, I got there and I could have given medical assistance. That's exactly what I should have done. So based on your training and experience and what you had seen, um, what did you want to do for this person on the ground? Had, had they let me into the scene, I, I already had decided what his level of consciousness was, so I would have requested additional help I would have wanted someone to call 911 for the paramedics and fire to come. I would have asked someone to run to the gas station and look for an AED. Um, and I would have checked his, I would have checked his airway. I would have been worried about his a spinal cord injury because he had so much weight on his neck. I would have opened his airway to check if there were any obstructions. And I would have checked for a pulse. And when I didn't find a pulse, if that was the case, I would have started compressions. And I didn't have my bend bag, so I would have continued compressions. We don't do, um, we don't give mouth to mouth anymore. 
Um, so I would have continued compressions at a rate of 100 um, a minute until help arrived. And by compressions, what do you mean? Um, I would have pre put my hands, um, stacked my hands and pressed his chest. Chest compressions. Chest compressions, yep. correct. Yeah. And what's the point of doing chest compressions? Um, pumping, pumping the blood for somebody that's not doing that themselves, um, trying to get a pulse back. And were you able to do that, any of those steps? No, sir. Why weren't you able to do any of that? Because the officers didn't let me in to the scene. I also offered, in my memory, I offered to walk, kind of walk them through it or, or told them, if he doesn't have a pulse, you need to start compressions. And that wasn't done either. And so when it, well, is this, are these things that you wanted to do? It would have, it's what I would have done for anybody. And when you couldn't do that, how did that make you feel? Totally distressed. Were you frustrated? Yes. Ms. Hansen, you know, I, as I told you, we can take our time. So feel free to just take a minute. And if you need a drink of water, go ahead. While you were there, uh, were there other people around you on the sidewalk? Yes. And were they um, saying things to the officers as well? Yes. And do you remember what kinds of things they were saying? Um, no, I was pretty focused on um, trying to get the officers to let me help. And how were you doing that? trying to get the officers to focus on you and get help? Uh, I think, I've, in my memory, I tried different tactics of um, calm and reasoning. Um, I tried to be assertive. Um, I, I pled and was desperate. Did you also at some point start raising your voice? Yes, sir. And maybe used some foul language even? Yes, sir. Why? Um, because... I was desperate to help, and I wasn't getting what I what I needed to do and gaining access. And at some point, the voices of the other people around you, did you feel that sort of interfered with getting the officer's attention? Yes. Um, so as you're doing that, were you able to pay more attention or need more attention to Mr. Floyd and his condition? I, I wasn't, I wasn't really able to, I, I knew he needed help. So at that point it was just getting in there. When you asked the officers to take his pulse, did you ever see them doing that? No. Um, when you were over on the sidewalk, um, at Officer Tao's direction, were you able to see the other two officers on Mr. Floyd? From my memory, just their, just kind of their heads. So if at some point they may have checked a pulse, you may not have seen that either. Correct. All right. During this time, did you make any note, uh, observations or notations of, uh, notes about Mr. Floyd's characteristics of his breathing? That was a terrible question. Do you want me to start over? Yes. Okay. During the incident, when you were there, did you make some observations of sort of the characteristics of Mr. Floyd's breathing that concerned you? I don't remember anymore. Okay. What is, what is meant by the term agonal breathing or agonal breaths? Agonal gasps uh, we see in patients 
that are dying or pretty much dead. Um, it's just kind of the bodies. Forgive me, I don't, I don't quite know, but it's, it's a sign of death. And have you seen that in other calls when you've been working? Yes. And did you see something similar in Mr. Floyd? I don't remember anymore, but I, um, I don't know. Okay. So during that time period, um, he uh, did not regain consciousness that you saw? No. And you stayed um, with him or I'm sorry, you um, were there the entire time until he was loaded into the ambulance, correct? Correct. And uh, at some point uh, you made well, I guess the, the question is this. Um, you didn't pay close attention to Mr. Floyd at some point because you knew he was unconscious. Needing medical attention, there was no question. Right. And based on that, um, you focused more on trying to get the officers to allow you to help. Correct. And at some point, did you start video recording uh, yeah. your interaction? Yes. And with your phone, I assume. Yes. And why did you do that? It was, I'm not sure why I chose to do it. It was it's an instinct. And um, so you did record it? Yes, sir. And based on that, um, well, I, I guess I'll just ask it this way. At some point after the incident, you were interviewed by uh, law enforcement officers. They. Uh, the BCAs? Or? Correct, yes. Yes, sir. And you made that video available to them, correct? Correct. All right. And you know, why did you think it was important to record that? Um, because memories of witnesses are never going to be as good as a video. And so you wanted to have it to preserve. It wasn't conscious, but I'm, I'm sure that's why anybody takes a video. Yeah. And um, sorry, just bear with me a second while I okay. try to read my own handwriting. Um, After recording that video, um, you um, stopped recording at some point, correct? I don't remember. Okay. Well, obviously you did stop at some point, right? Well, yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, um, and, and, and eventually the ambulance took Mr. Floyd away. Right. And then earlier I said we'd come back to that moment in the previous video in Exhibit 11 when you were, the ambulance left and you were still standing on the sidewalk there. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. And we saw you just standing there. What's going through your mind as you're standing there? I, I'm not sure. I, I think I probably was in disbelief. And kind of in shock? Yes. And what, um, and at some point then, um, did you also uh, make a 911 call? Yes. And it, it had to be uh, sort of like distressing was the word you had used before. Uh, did you have, a, when you're there and you're trying to help and couldn't, did you have a feeling of helplessness? Absolutely. Were you upset about that? Yes. Did you feel that, um, you know, whatever the end result, you could have tried to help? Sustained. 
Um, well, why did you feel helpless? Because um, there was a man being killed and I would have, had I had, had access to a, a call similar to that, um, I would have been able to provide medical attention to the best of my abilities and this human was denied that right. And so from that point, um, you know, we saw you standing there on the sidewalk, uh, just sort of standing still. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and from there, did you um, stay in the area for a little while? Yes. And at some point you made a 911 call? Yes. Why at that point did you call 911? Um, I think it all settled in that I wish I would have done that immediately because it made it was ridiculous that 17 station fire station 17 was as close as it was um, and that they hadn't been there I should have called 911 immediately but I didn't and when things calmed down I realized that I, I wanted them to know what was going on. Um, I wanted to basically report it. And so you made that call, correct? Correct. And um, a little bit more than a minute long. At some point they wanted to transfer you to a supervisor, correct? Correct, I asked for that. And, uh, but then the call ends. Okay. Do you remember why the call ended at that point? I don't know exactly, but um, there was kind of a lot going on. Um, I was still worried about the witnesses on scene, um, particularly because they were people of color and black men. Uh, I was worried about their safety um, and their officers still on scene. But also fire came um, and I, it may have been that I ended the call because my co-workers were there and I could tell them what was going on. So tell us about that. So at some point when you're there at the scene still, did a fire truck come? Yes. And they're coming to respond to the call. Correct? They're coming to respond to the call. Um, and they went into Cup Foods to actually look for a victim, um, which is unique uh, for that um, there to be that much miscommunication. So let me ask you just a little different question. So when they came, those firefighters, did you know them? I knew two of them. And how many total came? Four. A uh, driver, two firefighters, and a captain. And so the two that you knew, how did you know them? Um, crossing paths at work. So they knew who you were? Y yes. So you knew that members of the fire department knew you were on scene as well? Yes. But off duty, of course. Yes. And... Um, And so you had a conversation with them while they were there at Cup Foods? Yes. And you also had some conversations with other people who had stuck around afterwards? Yes, and the two, the driver and the other, other firefighter that weren't in the ambulance came back and I also spoke to them. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Nelson. You may. Everybody can just stay on a stretch of place if you'd like.
please. Hi. Just have some follow-up questions for you. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, you testified that you've been a firefighter now for two years approximately. Correct. And uh, I see you're wearing your uniform today. Correct. And that would be like your dress uniform or your class A uniform. Correct. And that's common to wear when you testify in court. Correct. Fair to say that you were not wearing your class A or any uniform on May 25th, 2020. Correct. I was off duty. Right. Okay. Um, being a firefighter is a stressful job. Correct. Uh, you testified about your experience as an EMT, but we didn't talk much about your firefighter training. Okay. So you said you went through a four month academy, correct? Correct. And in that academy, I assume you learn like the basics of fire, right? Correct. Like different types of backdrafts and Building whatever. Building construction. Right. Um, how to approach a fire, how to, you know, where to aim the hose, I guess. More. Yes, but fire is fire. <laughs> right. So it's some, but sometimes you probably got to come from the top down or from the bottom up, right? Every, yeah, different always. Right. And you learn about like going into a burning building, right? Right. Um, being safe, being cautious. Right. It's a, again, part of what you have to learn is how to deal with the stress of being a job, of being a firefighter. Right. Do they, do you, in either in the academy or in your uh, continuing training, do you have um, trainings that focus on how to deal with the physical reaction to stress? Um, we, we do go over that in our um, trainings throughout the continuing ed. Um, also, I... Um, think you're suited or not for the job. Sure, takes a certain type of person to do the job, right? right? Um, but breathing becomes important, right? Right. You put on a, an oxygen tank, a mask. Yep. You've gotta know how to breathe properly. Controlling your breathing, right. And sometimes you may go into a situation, it's not totally on fire and you may not have your mask on, you're running upstairs to get to save someone's life, Again, controlling your breathing. Right. right. And um, you learn about, uh, do you, have you ever heard the term tunnel vision as a part of fire training? Um, not, necessarily as a, not necessarily as a part of fire training, but I know right. what tunnel vision is. So when you're stressed, you kind of focus on yeah. a particular thing. Right. Right. And it kind of changes your peripheral vision and you become hyper-focused, right? right. Mm -hmm. um, so you're familiar with that and you may have experienced that in the context of your firefighting. Yes. And um, obviously, uh, and, and unfortunately, I'm assuming that sometimes um, you're not able to save everyone, right? Correct. And that there's a level of trauma that comes with that, right? Sometimes. Right. Depending on the circumstances. Correct. You um, also testified that you have both a national and state certification as an EMT, right? Correct. Um, that stands for Emergency Medical Technician. Correct. And that's basic first responder stuff, right? Uh, medical training for first responders. Um, I, I believe that there's more more basic. I mean, I, don't, I think the police officers are not emergency medical technicians. Right. But then it's not as high as like a paramedic. Correct. Right? So a paramedic has even more training than an EMT. Yes. Right. And obviously, maybe the CPR you learned to become a lifeguard was less, less intensive than what it took to become an EMT. Right. Um, I took I took it much more seriously because I was practicing it and using it. But it's the same. Yeah. Um, but in in your EMT training, you also learn like tourniquets and splinting and right. like I mentioned before. Yep, all of these sort of assessment um, and um, emergency first response of care. Yep. Okay. Um, and you testify that you because you've only been a firefighter for two years, mm -hmm. you've you've been in several burning buildings. Correct. Now. 
Have you ever been in a burning building or outside? Let's say you're outside. Let me ask you a hypothetical question. Mm -hmm. You're outside of a burning building and you're spraying the hose on the fire, mm -hmm. right? Um, has anyone ever tried to come up to you and say you're doing it wrong? No. Do you think that, um, ha has anyone ever stopped to film you to, when you're fighting a fire? Yes. Okay. So you see someone, you're, you're fighting the fire, yeah. and someone starts to film you. Does that, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Try not to interrupt each other. I, it's not conscious, but. Yeah, it's. I don't think it's it's, it's not a normal conversation, yeah. so we get it. Okay. We all started talking at one time. Even. Okay. So it, it's, it's unusual, but I'm sorry, and I'll try to slow down too, right? So you're fighting a fire, right? And you may notice a citizen filming what you're doing. Correct. And that would not necessarily interfere with your ability to fight a fire. No. Right? Have you ever had a citizen start to yell at you while you're fighting a fire? No. Do you think it would make your job fighting the fire harder if someone started yelling at you and telling you that you were doing it wrong? I'm very confident in the training that I've been given, so um, I, I would not be concerned about somebody that was not trained to the extent I have been, and I would continue to fight the fire the way I would. Right. But do you think it would be distracting? No. What if there were 12 people yelling at you and telling you that you were doing it wrong? I think um, a burning structure in a city where there are buildings and homes and people living on either side is much more concerning than 20 people trying to tell me to do something different. Right. But you, you wouldn't be distracted by that at all? No. What if they started calling you names? Like I said, I know my job and I, I would be confident in doing my job and there's nothing anybody could say that would distract me. Okay. So um, what if they started to physically threaten you? I'll repeat myself because I'm confident in my job and what I do and what needs to be done and my training, so I would continue to do that. What, what is staging, what does it mean when a fire department stages at an incident? They're, um, it, it's always different, but uh, we can stage to wait for someone to assess what's exactly going on and what, how we need to tackle that particular call. Okay. So let's assume there's a call and the police are on scene at the call, right? And they- Are you, sorry to interrupt. Are you talking about a medical call? We stage for a different thing. Sure. Let's let's leave it as a medical call. Okay. And there's some trouble at the scene. Does do you just come right in into that emergency call or does fire stage until police clear the scene? We stage and wait for police to give code for. Right. Code clear. for means all clear. Safe. So in a situation where there is trouble mm -hmm. and the police are dealing with that trouble and they know they need a medical personnel to come into the scene, yeah. medical won't come into the scene until it is called code four, right? Correct. All right. And um, you said in your experience, you've been on numerous calls throughout the two years you've been a firefighter, right? Correct. And. Uh, what would you agree that a, a fair number of those may have been calls that started out as call where the police responded first? Correct. So it's usually the police that are there first, they do some assessment, and they will call for medical. Correct. Okay. Have you ever been called to a scene where the police didn't call you? Mm -hmm. Meaning the police were present and they weren't the ones that called you. Can you repeat the question? Sure. It's a little confusing. Police go to a scene, right? And whatever's happening at the scene, and they just don't ever call for medical even though there's a medical situation. Well, I wouldn't know because that means I wasn't called to it. Precisely, right? So if you go to a scene, it's because you're responding to a call, right? Correct. And the reason that you're there is because the police call you. If 
the police are on the scene first. Right, if the police are on the scene first. And so in a situation where you see someone having a medical emergency, right, wouldn't it be reasonable to assume that the police had already called for medics? It would also be reasonable to assume that if the patient was cuffed I'm and- I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna cut, I'm gonna say objection non-responsive. The answer is restricted. Wait for the question and then answer the question that is asked. It's a yes or no question, ma'am. Is it reasonable to assume that if a patient is having a medical emergency and the police are present, that they have called for EMS. Your call, your question is unclear because you don't know my job, so um, okay. can't answer. Sure. So let's let's take this scene, right? Mm -hmm. May twenty fifth, two thousand twenty. You walk upon a scene. You see someone having a medical emergency, right? You did not call nine one one to get the medics there, right? Right. Would it have been reasonable to assume that medics had already been called based on what you saw when you first arrived? Yes. And in fact, paramedics did respond, right? You saw the ambulance come up. Yes, that's not their normal response time. Okay. And so you noticed there was some abnormal response time for medics. Right, and I also noticed that that is precisely the kind of call that fire would respond to and station 17 is just a couple blocks away. Okay, so do officers on scene decide do we call for medic or fire? I don't believe so, I believe that's dispatch. I, they, they call for medical So if, if attention. police call dispatch and they say EMS, we need EMS code three, it's dispatch who decides, do we send medics or fire? Well, it would be medic, it would be fire with medics, not just fire ever. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Fair enough. But ultimately, medics did arrive, right? Um, yeah, eventually. And you have no frame of reference of when police called paramedics, do you? No, but I know how long it takes for medics to get to calls typically, and I know how long it takes to drive three blocks in an emergency fire vehicle. But pres that presumes that the fire vehicle was not on another call, right? It would have been a different station that was, we would, the nearest, the nearest two other stations would have been able to respond to that call in three minutes. So if you, uh, first walked on scene at 8.26.29. That was what we just saw. Okay. 8 26, 29. Okay. And paramedic and paramedic paramedics had been called at 8.21. That's an abnormal response time based on your experience. What time did you say I arrived? 8.26.29. And, they, and the medics arrived at what time? The medics were called at 821, code three. I don't believe that. But again, you have no frame of reference, right? I mean, you've not seen any police reports, you've not looked at the cabs, you've not heard the 911 calls, you didn't listen to dispatch that night, did you? That night? No, not that night. Okay. But I, that's totally abnormal. All right. And fire would have been added to that call because we go to calls like that all the time. Right. And so it was abnormal. It would be completely and totally abnormal in your experience for it to take that long to get to the scene. Absolutely. All right. And um, are you familiar with the term load and go? Yes. And I believe you had a conversation with uh, the BCA agents shortly after this incident, and you described what you observed as far as the paramedics doing was what's called a load and go, right? Correct. And, the, and that is essentially, if I, as I understand it, paramedics arrive, some, something is amiss at the scene, mm -hmm. 
So we put them into the ambulance and we move the ambulance to another. A safe location to right. address the needs. And that's what you observed here, right? Correct. And that's uh, because there were quite a few people and those people were all fairly upset, right? Correct. And so in your mind, as a paramedic with the experience that EMT. you have. Oh, I'm sorry, as an EMT, I apologize. But as an EMT, you've done load and goes before? We've done load and goes, yeah. Right. And so the reason that the medics did not commence, at least as far as you understood, commence resuscitative efforts for Mr. Floyd was because they were doing a load and go, get him away. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Overruled. That's what you told the agents, right? Uh, I don't remember exactly what I told the agents, but that would it looked like a load and go to me. Okay. Um, now, in terms of um, your again personal experience, mm -hmm. uh, or excuse me, on that day. You were, the, the paramedics drove off, and then at some other point, a couple minutes later, is when the truck, the fire truck arrives, right? Right, and that's how I knew there was something wrong when requesting medical assistance. Okay, because the, the, para, or the fire sh department showed up at Cut Foods, and the ambulance had already left and gone to another location. No, more because the fire fire whether it's 17s or a different station would have been able to respond to that call much sooner than medics were All right. so in a I mean you you kind of formed that opinion on that day that there were some miscommunications between medics and fire and police um, Right, which, I mean, not to the fault of medics or fire. It's, we get a call and we go. Okay. So it was, it was police and dispatch that that miscommunication would have come in. Okay. Um, and again, that five or six minute delay is just unheard of in your experience. Uh, yes. Uh, not by medics, but by fire specifically. Are you trained uh, as an EMT in the use of Narcan? Yes, sir. And can you explain what Narcan generally is? Um, it's an opioid reversal uh, medication. Um, we give it intranasally, um, but a lot of people on the street have a um, injectable form. Kind of like an EpiPen almost, right? Yeah, kind of. Um, you testified that the firehouse that you work at, uh, you deal with a lot of overdose calls. Correct. And um, so you've had a lot of experience dealing with people who are overdosing. Correct. From, from opiates or from other controlled substances. Correct. And you have seen, um, you have seen uh, or dealt with many people who come out of an opiate overdose because of Narcan. Correct. Right. Um, if I if I didn't have Narcan though, we still give. Uh, if we'll monitor a pulse and give compressions as necessary. Um, I've never not had Narcan, but I would be able to give medical attention to somebody that had overdosed on an opioid and lost their pulse. Okay, so let me ask you, um, is it fire department policy when you are going to a call of an overdose that police are also dispatched to that call? I believe so, yeah. And that is because when people are revived from that, they often become combative, right? Um, not often. I'm sorry. Not often. But it happens. It, I've seen it happen.
Now I'm going to just kind of talk to you a little bit about um, your testimony about uh, May 25th of 2020. You were out for a walk because it was your day off, right? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you're out for a walk and uh, you're walking down, you're walking westbound on 38th Street and you see the lights and you said it's not uncommon to see lights there? In my neighborhood, in not, not on that corner, but in my neighborhood. Okay. Um, or in the city. Right. Okay. And uh, as you walked what would be the southeast corner of 38th in Chicago, you talked to, you heard a woman say, yelling that they are killing him, right? Right. And so you did this kind of circle loop to visualize and see what was going on, right? right. And um, at the point that you came on scene, Mr. Floyd was already on the ground, right? Correct. And Mr. Floyd, um, you saw what you what your memory told you was four police officers on him, right? Correct. But you now know that it was three, right? Correct. And I think you made some reference about why you videotaped because our memories are fallible, right? right? And again, a stressful situation can impact your memory, right? Absolutely. That's why we're lucky it was videotaped. Right. It's also fair to say that once you kind of came, you first talked to Officer Tao, and you said that you identified yourself as a Minneapolis firefighter, right? Correct. And Officer Tao asked you to step onto the curb, and you did that, Correct. right? And you would agree that when you first arrived on scene, your own personal, I'm just talking about you personally, your own personal demeanor was much more calm. Correct. And as you were there between 826 and 8.30, so in about those four minutes, um, you would agree that your own demeanor got louder and more frustrated and upset. Um, frustrated, I'm not sure is the word I would use. Angry? More desperate. And you called the officers a bitch, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got quite angry after Mr. Floyd was loaded into the ambulance and there was no point in trying to reason with them anymore because they had just killed somebody. So in terms of the in terms of the time that you were there, you have no idea what those officers were doing on the side of the car, right? Uh, the officers that I couldn't see from my vantage point, is that what you're asking? Right. Um, you right, don't know what they were doing. I couldn't see the two junior officers, um, except for maybe like their shoulders up. And um, so it's fair to say you don't know what they were doing. Correct. You don't know what they were talking about. The two of them, no. And there was a uh, again, you described a fairly large crowd, 10, 12 people that were all in that general area. Mm -hmm. And several people were yelling, right? Right. And some people were yelling louder than others, right? Right. And some, a lot of people were saying things like, get off of him, right? Right. And a lot of people, you yourself were saying, I want to know what his pulse is. Yeah. Right. And some, some people were, um, Swear. Absolutely. And would you describe other people's demeanors as upset or angry? Um, it's it's I I don't know if you've seen anybody be killed, but it's upsetting. Okay. Um, answer yes, I was just going to object, Your Honor. As argumentative, and you can proceed. I'm going to just ask you to answer my questions as I ask them to you. Okay. You also talked about how when you first approached, you saw the complete and total body weight of all three officers on Mr. Floyd. I never said all three officers. 
I, I, their body weight was on him. The, the two in the back, their, their full body weight was seeming to be on him, but that's not something that would kill. All right. In the, but you, you testified that the okay, yes. body weight, yes, the the body weight. Yes. was on. Just answer his questions if you okay. so, so just to be clear for the record is clear. You testified. Yes. Okay, don't, let me finish my question. Finish your question. You testified that when you first arrived, you observed the weight of all three officers on Mr. Floyd. Yes or no? Yes. But again, once you were ushered or commanded or directed, whatever term you want to use, to the curb, you again, as far as the other two officers, you were not watching who had their weight, where, or what. I could, correct, I could not see the other two officers. I could see them and they were not talking much. Okay. I could see their faces. A um, lot of people were yelling. Right. And again, you were not paying attention to what they were saying. Um, just here and there. Okay. So do you remember what the officers were talking about? Oh, the officers, no, I have no idea. Uh, they, they weren't talking. All right. You also testified that as you were observing uh, Mr. Chauvin on George Floyd, that you formed the opinion that Mr. Chauvin's hand was in his pocket. Correct. And you described him as comfortable. You also testified that you observed what you thought to be fluid coming from Mr. Floyd's body and you assigned that or you believed that to be urine. I, I considered that, that it was and took that as a sign. Do you recall did. telling the agents that it was his urine? I don't recall. And you said that, you testified that your focus became really sort of zoomed in on trying to get the attention of the officers, right? Not the attention so much as um, trying to reason with them and gain access to get medical attention. And you testified that you believe that the other voices, the voices of other, other people, interfered with you, you getting their attention. I was worried about it, but I know that Tao could hear me talking because he was responding to me directly. Now, in terms of your uh, the statement that you gave, you uh, were interviewed by agents Lund, Matthew Lund, and agents James Ryerson. Do you recall those names? No. Do you dispute me if I'm telling? No. And would you dispute me if I told you that that interview took place on May 28th of 2020? No. And before coming into court, did you have an opportunity to review your statement at all? Um, I had the opportunity to, but I didn't. Okay. Um, you never read the transcript of your statement or anything? I chose not to. Okay. Um, I just want to just ask you a few questions. You, you said that Officer Tao at some point said, if you're really a firefighter, you should know better. Correct. Right? Um, have you been to other scenes where people are trying to interfere with police officers doing their jobs? No, not really. Okay. Not that I can recall. Do you remember telling the agents that you believed that Officer Chauvin had his hands in his pocket? 
Um, vaguely remember saying that. Do you recall telling the agents that you were pretty certain the fluid was coming from Mr. Floyd's body and that's what made you think he was dead? I'm sure I said that. Pretty, pretty sure. Do you recall describing the crowd as a heavy crowd? No, I don't recall. Would it refresh your recollection to review the transcript of your statement? Um, I don't want to. Okay. Would you dispute me if I told you that you told the agents it was a heavy crowd? I, no, I guess not. Do you recall after paramedics took Mr. Floyd and then you had a conversation with uh, the firefighters that arrived, that how you described the physical appearance of Mr. Floyd? I don't recall. Do you recall telling them that he... I don't want to argue with. What's your grounds? Sustained. You may impeach if you wish. All right. I know you don't want to look at your transcript, but I'm, may I approach the witness? Mm -hmm. Ms. Hanson, you may show up. My counsel is page 82 to 85, page 11. you describe Mr. Floyd as a small, slim man? Overruled. Yeah, it appeared to, uh, with three grown men on top of somebody, it appeared that he was small and frail. Okay. But I know that's I'm not a, to be there's true, no obviously. Question. I was finishing my answer. Uh, members of the jury, we're going to please remain. Uh, please uh, move the jury back into the courtroom. Counsel, remain. Witness, remain. We're outside the hearing of the jury, Ms. Hanson, I'm advising you, do not argue with counsel, and specifically, do not argue with the court. Is I, the I cameras off? Are the cameras off? No, they are not. We are on the record. Okay. You will not argue with the court. You will not argue with counsel. Mm -hmm. They have the right to ask questions. Your job is to answer them. I was finishing my answer. I will determine when your answer is done. Okay, well... And so, do not argue with the court. Do mm -hmm. not argue with mm -hmm. counsel. Answer the questions. Do not volunteer information that is not requested. The attorneys for the state have redirect. They can ask you questions if they think that certain things were left out. Okay. It is the counsel's prerogative to ask you leading questions and for you to answer those and not volunteer additional information. Okay. Are we clear on this? We're clear. Thank you. Come back tomorrow at 9.30. All right. Good night. Do we have the person with the cell phone? Could we arrange to have that person come down? Somebody from the state to have access to that person? If you could have that person come in.
Human disaster. But do we have this person? Yeah, I think somebody went to find the person. I, I escorted that particular individual. So if you'd like right. to uh, double check on that and come right back, this should count. Why don't we uh, go back into chambers while we're waiting? And fill that yes, sir. Is present. Once they're present, they can be escorted up to the podium. All right, we're on the record. Uh, Ma'am, uh, could you identify yourself for the record? Rachel Jackson. And spell your names, please. R-A-C-H-A-E-L-J-A-C-K-S-O-N. And is this your phone? Yes. Okay, it's my understanding that the deputy seized it because you were taking pictures on the 18th floor? Yeah, I was in the elevator bank. Didn't know I couldn't take a picture. I apologize, I apologized to him then. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't know. What's your connection to this case? I'm here with Miss Frazier and her attorneys and her mother. I'm sorry? I'm here with Darnella Frazier and her attorneys and her mother. Okay, are you a family member or? No, uh, spokesman, family media representative. I've been keeping the press off of her. Okay, so you're a media representative? Yeah. Are you? A PR person. <laughs> I've been managing the media for Darnella Frazier. Understood. Keeping them at bay, not allowing her to do interviews, just keeping her out of the public sphere. Understood. Um, what was the purpose of taking photographs in so a secured just, area? So um, the Attorney General was talking to her and I just took a picture to memorialize it for her so she can look back on it one day. That's all. Not for public uh, consumption, for sure. If you're a media representative, it's very important you understand that courthouses have very strict rules about cameras. Right. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I know better than to disobey a judge's order. Uh, I'll, t I'll chalk this up to that you did not, you were not aware of the order. I no, think, I wasn't aware. I think you should in the future remember that all courthouses have very strict rules against cameras. The rules that allow cameras in this trial for broadcast were very restrictive. 
very uh, detailed because we do not allow cameras to be taken even on a less than high profile trial. Yeah. Cameras are not allowed up in the government center tower. They are definitely not allowed on a secured floor like this. I am actually asking that you you must delete the picture. Oh, I offered to do that. And recall any uh, places you have posted it. Oh, no, and I haven't posted it. So why don't you come up, up here and I'll give you your phone back. Okay. Please advise anybody who else might be thinking <laughs> of doing this not to do it. No, I will. It's a lesson learned. We'll leave it at yep. that. Come on up come and I'll give you this back. I understood. I'll, I'll take the apology and I'll attribute it to good faith uh, mistake. All right. Thank you. We're adjourned until tomorrow.